all set. Good morning, Pratipa, ma'am. Uh, good morning, ma'am. Good morning, ma'am. Seminar is going well. Congratulations to Pratipa. Very, 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 very. That means uh, it is not worth to say. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I'm yeah, we had such wonderful speakers. <laughs> getting continuous feedback to the YouTube also because yeah. uh, this is to stream to my uh, YouTube, no, my email, yeah. and yeah. just uh, uh, pasted to the Facebook also, ma'am. Mm. From our side, uh, yesterday I have seen for the live session. Our side, many teachers have attended, ma'am. Many college teachers and yes, yes. Their persons have also pulled a last uh, uh, yesterday. One ma'am called me, uh, Daso ma'am. She is from Beauty College, Delga. She told me 9:32. Uh, from completion, I sat there and she said to composition to all the team, ma'am. Very nice, ma'am. <laughs> yes, we sent the link to almost all the colleges in Kerala, hoping that you know. Oh, now, ma'am, I have said from since 7.30 to 8.30, I was um, continuously sent to uh, YouTube account and all the day of the second day scheduled to everyone, ma'am. Yes, good, ma'am. <laughs> Wonderful. It is very, very nice to collaborate with you. We are so happy yeah. that this is happening. I know. <laughs> Your side work is to be much uh, than ours. <laughs> no, but I think it's 50 50. <laughs> Both of us have done a lot of work. <laughs> but muchier than that, that means the relation develop, it is very much. Uh, yes, exactly. Yes, we can work together in future too. We also have 70% girl students in our college, you know. Huh? So, yes, yes, our university is also the same, ma'am. For mm -hmm. all, uh, even the science department and also as well as social science department. Yes, yeah, we heard your VC talking about almost 80% uh, <laughs> yeah, students. Yes. Uh, everywhere that thing is happening. Uh, and because now our university has started past to the girl student also. And what happens, ma'am? Uh, majority of girl students are taking admission here only because of they are getting the direct hostel, ma'am. There is yes. not quota for uh, girls for the hostel, for other universities like this. Yes. Those girls who are getting the admission, they must be admitted to the hostel if they are requested now. Yes. And even the students who are getting fellowships, even though they are staying in hostel and they are pay, paying the extra charges, but they are staying in hostel. Yes. Okay. Now it's 9.30, I think. Shall we start? Priyanti ma'am is ready. Ah, yes, yes, we can start, ma'am. Uh, even though now it is 9.30 only, but yes. uh, many people are joining, ma'am. Okay. They, they will join. Shall we wait? 30 people have joined, ma'am. Uh, join one by one, ma'am. It is early morning. Should we wait, Lena, or? 
How many have joined so far? Uh, Thirty people have joined, ma'am. Thirty four. Ah, uh, think. Ah, uh, thirty four. Thirty four. More will join. Hi. Shall we wait five minutes, sir? We will start, ma'am. The people will join yeah. one day. We will ask the speaker also, Priyanti, ma'am. Shall we wait for five more minutes to for more people to join? <laughs> I'm okay. Has uh, yeah. yesterday we had side? yesterday we had more than hundred, so I think lots of people will be coming at this time. Coming, it is early morning, ma'am. Yeah. So that will uh, people will be. To, it is as if everyone has to be. Everything is to be start from eleven uh, thirty or ten thirty like this. But they will join, ma'am. No problem. We will wait for five minute or otherwise. Okay, okay. Uh, we'll wait for five minutes and then we'll start. थाम जरा माइक बंद कर तो मग बोला
Shall we start, Prakiba, ma'am? Because it's already doing 40, I think. Really, no? oh, oh, oh. I think we should start now. Yeah, I think we should start. We should start now, ma'am. Yeah, people will join. I think we have the technical experts then. Mira, I think you can start. Okay, ma'am. Good morning, everyone. And I'm Mira here. Welcome you all to the second day of two-day virtual international conference on gender study post-1990. Technological encounter and narrative of empowerment organized by the TV Department of English, Sanadana Dharma College, Alapura, Kerala. Collaboration with Betty Bhatta Adhyan, Department of Student Development, Shivaji University, Kolapu, Maharashtra. Yesterday, had two theory sessions followed by six technical sessions. We have four theory sessions and six technical sessions. Where we will first presentation of various papers on different areas of gender studies. In this third plenary session, we have a very distinguished guest, Ms. Priyanti Fernando, Executive Director of International Women's Rights Action Watch Asia Pacific, and she will be delivering her talk on the topic Structural Inequalities of Technological Encounters. Before we move on to the main session, let me draw your attention to a few important instructions regarding our further proceedings. They will make you participate in the event without any confusion. In order to maintain that your auditory experience during the meeting, I request all of you to mute your audio and turn off your video. The plenary session will be followed by an interactive session. If you have any questions during the presentation, you can either type them into the chat box or you can directly ask your doubts in the question answer session scheduled at the end of the presentation. I request all the participants not to crowd the chat box with other messages. Feedback link will be provided in the chat box at the end of this session. That's all about it. And here we formally begin the third plenary session of the two-day virtual international conference on gender studies. With immense pleasure, I invite Dr. Bindu Nair, Associate Professor, Department of English, SD College, to formally welcome our plenary speaker. Thank you, Meera. Namaste and a very good morning and a very warm welcome to everyone present here on the second day of the two-day virtual international conference on gender studies post-1990s, technological encounters and narratives of empowerment, jointly organized by the PG Department of English, ST College and Shivaji University under the auspices of the Beti Bachao Abhiyan. It's my proud privilege to welcome all the organizers of this international conference, the Honorable Vice Chancellor of Shivaji University, the Registrar, the manager and principal of ST College Alipura, the HOD, Dr. Lina Pai, the organizing secretaries, Dr. Pratipa Desai, the coordinator of Beti Bachao Abhiyan, and Ms. Kartigar, assistant professor of ST College. I also welcome all the plenary speakers of yesterday and today. Uh, most of them have joined us today. Dr. Vibhuti Patel, Professor Habil, Dr. Roxana Marinescu, and Dr. Swapna Bobina. A very warm welcome to all the delegates and faculty of Shivaji University and ST College, teachers, scholars, students, paper presenters from all over the globe, and all our other guests who have joined us today. In this third plenary session, we have a very distinguished personality, Ms. Priyanti Fernando, a fiery feminist and activist, the likes of whom the world is greatly in need. Ms. Priyanti, is currently based in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, and is the executive director of International Women's Rights Action Watch Asia Pacific, a women's rights organization that works towards achieving gender equality and eradicating discrimination against women in countries around the world. She is also a social development and communications professional with over 30 years of experience, both in Sri Lanka and overseas. 
She has led several organizations like the Center for Poverty Analysis in Colombo, Sri Lanka, the International Forum for Rural Transport and Development Secretariat based in London, and the Sri Lanka Country Program of Intermediate Technology Development Group, now called Practical Action. She has an honors degree in sociology from the University of Peridenia and a master's degree in mass communications from the University of Leicester. Ms. Priyanti has long been very passionate about issues of justice for women and about fighting structural inequalities relating to gender, access to technology, eradication of poverty and livelihoods. She's worked in the areas of technology, infrastructure development, poverty eradication, bringing gender analysis and a feminist perspective into all her work. We are indeed proud, honored, and very happy to have you with us today, ma'am, to talk to us on the topic, structural inequalities of technological encounters, to share with us your vast and pertinent experience and scholarship on the overt and covert effects of technology on the gender divide. A very warm welcome, ma'am, and over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm not sure I deserve that uh, very lovely introduction, but thank you so much. And thank you so much for inviting uh, Iro, uh, the International Women's Rights Action Watch Asia Pacific to be part of what seems to be an incredibly interesting and well-organized online space. So uh, I'm really privileged to be here uh, to make, um, to follow on from the two um, key um, uh, key speakers uh, in the plenary, plenary sessions yesterday, uh, Professor Patel and Professor Marinescu, who I heard yesterday, I think is a bit of a daunting task. Uh, but I will try my best. So um, let's see whether I can actually now share my presentation. Okay, can you tell me if it's on? If you can see it? It's on, ma'am. Perfect. Yes, okay. Yes. Okay. So thank you so much. Uh, as was uh, said before, the, my presentation is about structural inequalities of technological encounters. Uh, and I'm not at, attempting in this presentation to discount the benefits of technological advantages, advances that have helped uh, us, uh, the humankind, uh, do many things like reduce morbidity, lengthen life experiences, increase mobility around the world, made, made connectivity possible across borders, and generally improve the living conditions of many women, men, and children on this planet. Uh, the very fact that we can participate in this conference itself is the result of advances in communication technology and the amazing power of the internet. So, uh, but, I think we all know uh, that technology, like most human endeavor, is embedded in the political and economic fabric of the world as we know it. So even though technology has made unprecedented progress in our lifetimes and, the, uh, and is the right of everyone without discri discrimination to benefit from scientific progress, uh, this right is enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights uh, and in many other human rights instruments, as well as the Beijing Platform for Action in the spirit of the 2030 Agenda. Uh, we, despite, of all the, despite all this, we are also aware that everyone does not experience or has not experienced these advances equally. My aim in this presentation is to remind ourselves of what these structural inequalities are. The COVID-19 pandemic has certainly opened our eyes, if they weren't open before, to how starkly unequal our world is. And many of us, and feminists especially, are keen to build a new world that is more just and more equal. Uh, the, my presentation will focus on the structural inequalities of technology encounters experienced by women in the global south. 
Uh, it recognizes that uh, the intersectional nature of these experiences and how race, class, caste, sexual identity, work status, citizenship status, etc., mediate in how different groups of women encounter technology. And by saying Global South or focusing on developing countries or the third world, as some people call, call it, the paper will also point to another critical structural inequality, uh, the, uh, the North-South divide. This is largely ge geographic, though not always so, and is a result of histories of colonization and other oppressions and impacts uh, on how technology is made accessible, how technology is controlled, and fundamentally how technology is defined and perceived. So this brings me to the outline of this presentation uh, in sharing my perspectives on the structural inequalities of technological encounters, especially as they impact on women in the global south. I will look at three things, access to technology, control of technology, and the hierarchies of technological knowledge. This is merely actually a way of organizing my thoughts. Access, control, and knowledge of technology cannot be considered discreetly. They are inextricably linked. In the 21st century, there are countless examples of inequalities in access to technology and, and to the access to the benefits of technology. I'm going to begin by sharing what I think are two scandalous examples of unequal access uh, to some very basic technologies. Uh, first is the unequal access to electricity. Uh, I don't know whether you know who the two men on the left are. One is the, uh, Elon Musk, uh, the CEO of Tesla. And the other is Jeff Bezos, the CEO of um, Amazon. Uh, they are two of the world's richest men. They are technology billionaires. And in 2019, they were competing with each other uh, in a race to enable humans to live on the moon or on Mars. I think one of them prefers Mars to the moon. But statistics from just three years before that show that 940 million people on Earth, that is 13% of the world's population, still do not have access to electricity. Three billion do not have access to clean fuels for cooking. In 2019, uh, of the people who didn't have electrics, uh, access to electricity, 580 million people lived in Africa. Uh, the world energy outlook, suggests that because of the COVID-19 pandemic, some of the impetus behind the efforts to improve the situation has been lost because governments are uh, tending, to uh, in attending to the immediate public health and economic crisis and utilities and other entities that deliver access to electricity and water face serious financial constraints. So while African governments are struggling uh, on these uh, uh, struggling to face uh, with these challenges to bring it, uh, to bridge the electricity gap. The wealth of those two men on the left and eight other people like them rose by 540 billion US dollars during the same time. So let me go to scandal number two, uh, which is the unequal access to water. So huge strides have been made in improving people's access to safe water. Nine percent, but yet nine percent of the world does not have access to an improved water source. And 2.1 billion people, 29 percent of the world, do not have access to safe drinking water. This is a significant improvement since the 1990s, but it's not a cause for complacency. Unsafe water is still responsible for about 1.2 billion deaths each year and account for 6% of all deaths in low income countries. The FAO also tells us, the Food and Agriculture Organization also tells us that over 1.2 billion people live in agricultural areas, 
severely affected by water shortage or scarcity. Meanwhile, while meanwhile, while this uh, is the situation for many people around the globe, the bottled water industry continues to make huge profits. Nestle made uh, $7.7 .7 billion in sales, bottled water sales in 2017. And this is water that they extract usually from depressed municipalities in the US or poor villages in countries like Pakistan or Nigeria, depriving those villages in Pakistan and Nigeria of their own sources of clean water. In Pakistan, Nestle started selling its branded Pure Life water that you see in this picture in Lahore in 1998. Active, and their marketing campaign actively marketed it as a substitute for tap water, which they presented as dangerous and uncool. So the so people wanted to drink Pure Life. Uh, and the strategy took the pressure off the government to fix utilities and provide access to clean water to everyone. And this, of course, uh, because not everybody could afford pure life, exacerbated inequalities in access to clean water, drinking water and health outcomes. Uh, quite recently, I think about two weeks ago, we learned that uh, the state of California in the US allowed water to become a tradable commodity. This is a very dangerous development. UN agencies and special, special rapporteurs have already pointed out the dangers of commodifying water because it leaves room for large agricultural and industrial players to gobble up the world's limited water resources uh, at the expense of small scale farmers and poor households as we see, uh, have already seen in the case of Nestle and use it in ways that doesn't necessarily benefit women or poor communities. I call this to uh, the unequal access to electricity and to water scandals because it is not that the world does not have the resources, the knowledge or the technology to provide universal access to these very, very basic needs. But because we choose not to prioritize our investments to get electricity and water to everyone, we tend instead to focus on colonizing the moon or developing our military technology or reducing our taxes so that corporations and big business can make huge profits. So it is a choice that our governments make. There are other inequalities as well. And uh, I think in the introduction, you heard that I worked for many years in the transport sector. Uh, investments in transport infrastructure are highly skewed in favor of major roads and highways. And this leaves uh, rural communities in many parts of the world in relative isolation and struggling to get their pro uh, produce to market or to get their sick people to a hospital or their children to school. Access to modes of transport are also unequal. Uh, in much of the global south, the more affluent cl classes have access to quicker, safer, and more comfortable modes of transport, while the poor travel on foot, on bicycles and animal carts, or in irregular and overcrowded public transport vehicles. The inequality is also apparent at the household level, and uh, where men are often given priority to the more expensive means of transport whether it is the single household bicycle or the ox cart or the camel cart or the motorcycle or motor car. Uh, globally, there is also, we think that mobile technologies have had a huge penetration around the world, which they have, uh, but there is still a gender gap in access to mobile phones. 80% uh, of women worldwide own mobile phones but women are still 10% less likely to own them than men. The situation varies with the regions and in our region in South Asia, uh, only 62% of the women have mobiles uh, and 28% of women are less likely to own a mobile than a man and 213 million women are still unconnected. And I just thought I'd also touch a little bit on reproductive technologies. 
We sometimes forget that menstrual management products like the disposable sanitary napkin or the tampon are also outcome of technological encounters and innovations. Disposable sanitary pads were available in the global north since about the 1800s or the late 1800s. And the modern tampon was invented by, believe it or not, an American guy called Earl Haas, who obtained a patent for his invention in 1933. Rather shockingly, these products are still not universally available to all women. Even in the USA, one out of five girls miss out on school because they do not have access to menstrual products and period poverty is being called a public health crisis. For many women in the global south, uh, these products are not available, uh, are not affordable actually, uh, and many girl children miss out of school because of menstruation. Uh, but of course, in, in, in many of the global south countries, the main public health crisis is not just about access to menstrual products. It's also about access to water, to hand washing facilities, to proper toilets and sanitation. These structural inequalities have consequences, obviously. So in our discussions of gender and technology, we need to recognize that some of the basic structural inequalities in access to technologies are critical to meet the meet, meeting the needs of base, uh, basic needs of women and girls, and that these are yet to be el uh, eliminated and that there are dire consequences of this. Um, we've talked about some of them before, but it's worth re reiterating that unequal access to electricity and clean water fuel means that many women in the global south are forced to spend their limited household income on inefficient and sometimes dangerous kerosene and candles for lighting. This girl's education is often restricted, uh, babies are born in the dark, uh, medical supplies in local clinics are compromised. The fact that 3 billion, that is 40% of the world, do not have access to clean fuels for cooking uh, means that 4.3 billion people a year die prematurely from illness caused by household uh, air pollution. And these are mostly women and young children because they are the ones who spend the longest time near the domestic hearth. Uh, the lack of water leads almost 900 children per day. That, that is a horrible statistic of one child every two minutes almost to die from diarrheal diseases, and that is caused by dirty water and poor sanitation. Uh, during the COVID-19 COVID pandemic, when we were instructed to wash hands, uh, this was not a luxury that many households could afford uh, because, they, because for them, water was a scarce uh, resource. Uh, in addition, of course, to the health outcome, uh, how negative health outcomes of uh, the lack of water, uh, it also places a heavy burden on women who, in, who are tasked in many communities with fetching water for the household and who are responsible for the health and well being of their families. Uh, underlying reasons for this unequal access, and I've mentioned it before, is not a lack of resources per se, but because global uh, governments in the global south have fallen back on their obligations to provide these basic necessities and electricity to all their necessities, water and electricity to all their citizens. They have relegated the provision of these utilities to the market. Uh, in, in, with, but the market, as we all know, is about efficiency and profit. And these yardsticks, do not allow them to provide these services to what is called euphemistically the bottom billiard or the last mile. Countries like Vietnam, Thailand, Costa Rica actually have taken the responsibility for uh, providing electricity to all and, start, and they started by electrifying areas where there was potential for commercial development and then moving into less profitable areas. But in many other countries, the disparities and inequalities of electricity provision 
continue to exist. Uh, the impact of the inequalities in technology uh, distribution, the provision of technolo these technologies ex is exacerbated by the income poverty of women and their lack of control over disposable income. Now that is the result of substantive inequalities in patriarchal societies that place women in a very inferior position in the family and in society at large and limit their access to, product, uh, to resources. Direct actions stemming from patriarchal and negative attitudes uh, continue to make the situation worse. I'd just like to share an example of how such inequalities are deliberately nurtured, even with technologies that seem ubiquitous. Uh, in 2016, a Hindustan Times article showed us how in, uh, in, a, in a village in Gujarat, unmarried women's use of mobile phones was banned, alleg alleging that cell phone usage would create disturbance in society. Now, this may be an isolated incident, but it is the sort of argument that, uh, that we see uh, throughout uh, history in Sri Lankan society in the early 20th century. Uh, un unmarried women were not allowed to cycle because it was uh, considered a threat to their virginity. So there are many ways um, in which um, in African societies, uh, and I think also in parts of India, uh, women are not allowed to use ox carts or uh, camel carts, but have to uh, manage with either head loading or using donkeys. So there are many reasons for which uh, many patriarchal controls over what women can do and can't do. Uh, and which results in cutting women off from owning and using the technologies, but also limits their communication, uh, restricts their ability to uh, access jobs and new opportunities, and of course, very strongly controls their autonomy and their independence. I just want to talk briefly about the control of technological encounters. Uh, we saw this in the example I just cited about Gujarat, how patriarchal attitudes and hierarchies control how women access and use technology. And these attitudes also affect the way in which technical education is structured uh, and technology is applied in the manufacturing processes. The stereotyping of women, the invisibilization of their capabilities and the exploitation of their role in providing care all converge to limit uh, their ability to take control of technological encounters. But this doesn't always play out uh, in expected ways. And I just wanted to share with you a story about uh, women's software, pro uh, software programming in the, uh, in the US, which I got from an article in the New York Times Magazine entitled The uh, Secret History of Women in Coding. And in this article, it shows how uh, the pro you were in the US, the proportion of women in computing and mathematical professions increased dramatically between 1960 and 1990, and then fell to below 1960 levels in 2013. So this is a curious phenomenon. And the article shows or argues that in the early years, there was a level playing field, right? Um, nobody knew much about coding, nobody knew much about programming, nobody knew much about computers. So anyone who was logical, good in math and meticulous were recruited to be programmers. And in fact, uh, at this point, it, uh, the uh, gender stereotype suggested that because women were good at painstaking activities like knitting, they would be good programmers. Um, uh, in, in those early years of computer technology, it was also true that software programming was considered less pre prestigious and was certainly less lucrative than hardware engineering. But many factors changed that around. The level playing field became gendered when, with, when, with the advent of personal computers. So when homes got personal computers, it began to be seen as a suitable technology for boys, not for girls. 
And this also got reflected in the education system. Uh, so boys entered the coding space with a distinct advantage over girls. Around the same time, the old hierarchy of hardware and software got inverted. The software became a critical and lucrative sector and of corporate America. And so, as happens when, as happens in patriarchal societies, men began to dominate the programming sector and a different stereotype of who should be a good programmer emerged. Of course, this is a very different situation uh, to what, ha what is, uh, happens in Asia. And that's also interesting because I, I'm sure that in, uh, I heard the conversation earlier and I know that there is a lot of enrollment of women in, uh, in science and technology areas in, in, the, in India. Uh, and, uh, and somehow this is supported by the Asian interest and pre premium we put on education. Uh, in Malaysia also, there seems to be no gender inequalities in the way young Malaysians engage with computer science, uh, even though male, stu male students may start with more computer skills, but the finer performances and the interest in pursuing a career in computers are not gender biased. But even though among the class of Asian women who are privileged to afford a STEM education, the outcomes are more equal than they are in countries of the global north, in sectors such as the apparel industry or in electronics, women in Asia remain at the bottom of the global value chain and have little or no control of the application of technology in their work. These ex industries continue to exploit the vulnerability of particular groups of women, poor women, uh, displaced women, migrant women, and control their bargaining powers and their ability to organize. These women are employed in precarious jobs with low pay, but they also face another potential threat, the looming possibility of automation that could lead to their jobs being replaced by robots. We think that uh, uh, some of the statistics that are being floated around is that 49% of work activities can be automated uh, with, uh, with currently available technology. But, uh, but and we, we tend to think that these will be only in the manufacturing sector, but that's not true because also in the services sector, especially in accommodation and food, an estimated 73% of the activities performed can be automated. So what are these activities? These are activities of preparing, cooking or serving food, cleaning food preparation areas, preparing beverages, collecting dirty dishes, all the things that are done by women and low income migrant workers. It's also uncertain whether with the COVID pandemic and the threats to global value chains, companies will speed up automation as a preferred option. Uh, finally, just a quick word about the hierarchies of technical knowledge. Uh, I believe you're all guilty of seeing technologies relating to high tech, uh, computers or mobile phones or all of that. Um, but the word technology, as you know, comes from the Greek word techni, which means art or skill and logos, which means knowledge. So technology really sh should have a much broader focus. Uh, and if we look at technology in a very broad way, as I have also done a little bit in the earlier uh, um, section, in the earlier bit of my presentation, uh, we will avoid devaluing what is indigenous knowledge and we will, we will stop making the knowledge of women invisible. Um, in the coastal areas of my home country, which is Sri Lanka, the knowledge tradition of fishermen is being eroded by more what is called modern technology or modern methods of fishing. But women's involvement in fishing, the technical knowledge they have, and their enormous contribution they make to household incomes and food security in the fishing community is almost completely and utterly invisible. Uh, generally, their uh, role is not even acknowledged by the fishing community itself. 
Uh, it's interesting also that women's ancillary activities like mending nets or, uh, and other activities they do to support uh, the male fishing industry is also seen as not requiring any technical skill. Uh, it's really interesting that uh, last year, at the end of last year, the International Women's Rights Action Watch uh, had a, a co-created co a Global South Women's Forum uh, with, uh, at the end, in December for five days uh, with uh, many organizations around the world. And in, at that forum, uh, we had a group of women from fishing communities along the Kenyan uh, coast, and it was incredible how similar their experiences were as well. We also know that, uh, and it's been extensively documented, that rural women's involvement in plant genetic resources in Latin America, Africa, and Asia um, uh, also show that women have technical knowledge, that they are also innovators, uh, particularly in the Andean highlands. Uh, small farmers um, are involved in all areas of the crop cycle, and this is about uh, potato farmers, um, uh, from selection of, uh, from seed selection to planting to harvest, storage, processing. And because of, because they have all these responsibilities, uh, they are able to determine which plant resources to conserve and use, which seeds to select, which crop varieties to grow, which food products to keep for home consumption, and which to sell on the local market. Uh, women farmers rely heavily on their traditional knowledge, but also when they're faced with new challenges, like challenges of climate change, for example, they devise new methods as they innovate and experiment on the locally uh, available materials. This conversation of seeds uh, has been, uh, uh, I mean, has been highlighted by Vandana Shiva, who has been warning us for several years about the discounting of women's seed and food knowledge and the transferring of the control of seed and food from women and to corporations by means of patenting and genetic engineering. Agriculture and food production gets transformed in corporate hands. Uh, and it is no longer then considered as uh, an endeavor for food security or for nourishment, but as a commodity that can be manipulated, monopolized, and used maybe as cattle feed or biofuel if these sources are more profitable. This is exactly the same thing I mentioned about commodifying water. So, None of the stories I have shared in this presentation are new or unknown to my, most of you. Uh, but I think it's worth reminding ourselves because they show that the structural inequalities of technology encounters are superimposed on the way our societies are structured. So in many ways, they reinforce the gender inequalities that prevail, follow the discourse of neoliberalism, and are bolstered by the power of patriarchy and, the, and capitalism. They discount, devalue, devalue, and invisibilize knowledge that is not aligned with their objectives, and in so doing, compound gender inequality and discriminate against women and other marginalized groups. But uh, to reiterate, the right of everyone without discrimination to benefit from scientific progress is enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the International Covenant of Economic, Social and Cultural Rights and other instruments of the human rights system. It is also very clearly articulated in the Beijing Platform for Action. And, and uh, yeah, I believe it is up to us to invoke uh, these international standards and the commitments that our governments have made to demand stronger state interventions, to ensure that all women benefit from science and technology, but also to encourage our governments to regulate and control the actions of corporations who in the current context are responsible for some of the more e egregious harms and violations that perpetuate gender inequality. Thank you. 
Thank you, Priyanti ma'am, for your valuable time and insightful commentary on the topic Structural Inequalities of Technological Encounter. It's really an interesting and informative session, ma'am. Shall we move on to the discussion session, ma'am? Yes, we can. Okay. So now we can begin the question answer session. So that uh, we have uh, a question from uh, uh, from Rajasri R. She uh, says that was a very insightful presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, when we speak of technological divide, we tend to think only in terms of internet and gadgets like smartphone. Your presentation reminded us of the broader aspects, including the basic amenities such as water and electricity, which we have often, often overlooked. As an administrative faculty of a feminist organization, can you please explain how your activities have been... Uh, so she... Uh, she does not complete that question, so I can't read it full. So yeah, that's I'm okay. Gonna... Uh, maybe I can. Maybe I can just say. I think maybe she wants to know what uh, we do at uh, Euro Asia Pacific to kind of address these inequalities. And um, the way we work largely is uh, through the. Uh, through other women's groups, right? So we work these, uh, we encourage women's groups to bring these, uh, to look at uh, the inequalities that uh, that are in their organ, in their uh, societies, in the, that they live, they live, they live with uh, these inequalities. And we, we look at how we can push uh, these conversations, primarily because that is our focus, uh, into the CEDAW space. The CEDAW is the com uh, Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. And uh, Euro Asia Pacific lives, uh, works very closely with the CEDAW committee. And we use that uh, to kind of uh, use that space to kind of advocate for the rights of women uh, in the different countries. So when uh, the CEDAW reviews our different kind of states, we encourage women to bring these issues of, uh, of uh, discrimination when it comes to access to water, to uh, electricity, to all of, all of these issues uh, to those groups. So I don't know whether that answers a question. Um, what, is, what really happens though, is that the women's movement has not been that um, strong on highlighting these uh, these structural inequalities relating to technologies, right? So it's mostly about violence or um, discriminations in the families or in societies. So I think it's it's well, one of the things that we are doing is trying to make uh, women aware that these these more global macro technical issues are really impacting on their lives. Hello? Hello? May I ask? Hello? Yes, ma'am, yes, you can ask. You yeah. Can... Uh -huh. Yes, ma'am. Uh, good morning, all of you. And uh, it's my uh, question to the uh, renowned speaker of this session. Uh, may I, madam, please ask you, whether you find any similarity in the condition of women in India in, and uh, in other nations uh, abroad. You know, uh, actually, the women are, uh, you know, subordinates. You know, they are considered subordinates in all the society, generally. Generally, so do you find any similarity in the treatment of women getting in all over the world? You know, whether it is uh, uh, equally uh, treated or, uh, you know, uh, or in other ways, okay, in other countries, just to compare to Indian women. Well, I'm not from India particularly, so I yeah, can't, yeah, that's, say, that's, I can't huh. say. Uh, uh, exactly, yeah. but uh -huh. I would I would imagine that uh, there is a huge that you are right when you say that uh, 
uh, gender inequality exists across the globe in every country. Uh, but again, we also have to remember that some women, uh, that gender, uh, all women are not also uh, the same. They are not homogeneous. So there are some women in India, I'm sure, that enjoy certain privileges uh, that other women say maybe in other parts of the world don't have, as much as there are other women in other parts of the world that have certain privileges that uh, women in India don't have. But generally, all, uh, the patriarchy, capitalism, uh, and the whole neoliberal project, which we the world seems to have, taken yeah, on board top lock and barrel uh, converge to kind of discriminate uh, against women and other groups. And so <laughs> therefore, uh, I think uh, task as feminists is actually to fight that, fight the patriarchy, fight the, what did they say, smash the patriarchy, fight capitalism and change the whole neoliberal con conversation. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Actually, uh, as you said that you are uh, not from India. So I would like to inform you that uh, we Indian women, you know, suffer on two sides. On two sides. First of all, Hinduism uh, doesn't make us to come up or to come ahead. And uh, means we are, uh, uh, you know, suppressed under the customs and traditions. Uh, and on the other side, uh, you know the uh, you know the woman woman as a human being uh, is considered as subordinate uh, in the society. So uh, uh, my question was that you know is the similar condition is the same condition happens in other countries other communities and societies all over the world. That's it, sir. That's it, ma'am. So the short answer is yes, and the short answer is that all religions yeah. uh, uh, do have a discriminatory approach to gender. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. And uh, very uh, happy to listen to you here, ma'am. Thank you. Hey, ma'am, uh, we have another question from Genga Shyama, and she asked, Ma'am, what is your opinion about the tech world becoming a bio grotopia, magical land where men flock together, generally men who are similar in background, approach, and personality type? Is it clear, ma'am? I think that is a very real danger, no? That uh, because as as that American example, which I thought was really interesting, showed that when when uh, when spaces become more lucrative or when they become more um, uh, more prestigious right uh, the the more powerful people so in this case the men try to invade those spaces right uh, and so yes i think that is a very um uh like i mean if it hasn't happened already it's already a, it's a very likely um scenario um can i ask you something just uh, con in continuation of what you just said yes uh, in india uh, recently we see that there are lots of women who are as you said coming into software and things like that and uh, even in spite of all that uh, why do you think this kind of male uh, sort of takeover happens in software well, the thing is that in soft, I, I'm, I'm, I think women coming, having numbers in any situation uh, is, is important, right? But I think just having women in numbers in a particular space doesn't necessarily change the patriarchal structures of those spaces. I mean, you, uh, India, uh, you and I come from two countries which had uh, and most of South Asia actually had countries with um, heads of state that were women, right? So you had Indira Gandhi, we had Sirima Mubanda Naka, we had uh, Chandrika Kumar Natunga. They, did that change the whole political structure of our societies? No, no okay. because very often women tend to kind of succeed or get into spaces and then adopt the same uh, 
patriarchal attitudes that uh, uh, men uh, that that are part of that the way that space is structured. So I think um, uh, Professor Patel said that very clearly yesterday that it's not about men or women really. It's it's about how the we how patriarchy. Uh, designs or structures the different institutions or spaces uh, in which it operates and that we need to kind of rethink that. And I think in the formal organizational space, it's even more difficult uh, because those spaces, I mean, an organization itself with its hierarchies and its um, in incentives to move upwards in the, in, is all very sort of uh, instinctively anti is not instinctively feminist. So to bring a feminist conversation into those spaces becomes even harder, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. That's true, ma'am. About the entire, yes, uh, we are still actually battling the internalization of patriarchy, right? Exactly. Yeah, thank you, ma'am. Okay, ma'am. We have uh, another question. It is from Ashwati R. and she asked whether it is possible or not to eradicate structural inequalities of technological encounters, enlightening them, that is non-binary, cis, lesbian, bisexual and transgender, with the help of law and medical technology, irrespective of their social status. Difficult question, no, that I don't really need to I think there's a lot of questions in that if I, I can't find it in the chat. But uh, but I think uh, it is a long question and it's about whether we can eradicate, uh, okay, whether it's possible to eradicate structural inequalities of technology encounters, enlightening them with the help of law and medical tech. I think all these are all, all the law um uh, the medical the legal profession the medical profession the way we operate uh all must work together to actually eradicate structural inequalities but whether it is possible or not to eradicate structural inequalities uh is is i think it's a very long term project right uh, and the reason i focused on the access to electricity and uh, water a lot is because I think that uh, to remember that even that, even that very basic right is not uh, not there for many women and uh, girls. And um, I like your question about non-binary, uh, uh, cis, lesbian, bisexual and transgender people because I think that all of these kind of uh, discriminations that I described become even more complicated when there is a layer of another set of discriminations uh, imposed on top of them. So I didn't specifically talk about uh, queer people, but if you're if you're queer, your and your society is not supportive of you, then you create, then there is even yet another level of uh, exclusion. Okay, ma'am, there is one more question in the chat box. Can I read it? I don't, I don't. Yeah, yeah, sure. Go on. This uh, question is from Lakshmi Jaimopin, and she asked, ma'am, now, uh, when you are talking this session, taking this session, you are using a technological aid. What are the ways to which you, as an activist, help create awareness about technologically deprived women, especially in the present world where coronavirus has created many barriers? Thank you very much, Lakshmi, for that question. Because, uh, like I said to you, uh, this is something that in our organization we are trying very hard to think about. Uh, in, uh, as I said to you, uh, I think I mentioned. Uh, last year, we had uh, this Global South Women's Forum where we had 24 organizations from all over the world and from different parts of uh, society actually participate in 24 uh, online sessions. 
and the way people participated were very different. So we had activists like us or academics like many of you, all kind of parties who have who had over the year actually got used to participating on Zoom calls on um, and so on, right? So there were those that level of participation. But then there were this Kenyan group of fisherwomen, right? And then there was also a group of um, women from uh, Sri Lanka, uh, a conflict affected uh, areas in the in the in the east. Uh, and uh, I think there were others, I can't remember who they were, but uh, who were also groups of, uh, as you say, women who had less access to technology. So they we kind of supported them because they did different they had they engaged but they also wanted to engage with this international space right so to in, to be inclusive of them what we did was we kind of encouraged them to do different things so they uh, one of the things they did was create a video among their own membership in their own context and share that video uh, with one person uh, in another context, people got together in there uh, because of the coronavirus and they couldn't get, uh, they got together in, uh, together in a space and then share uh, a new, in, in the local situation, they got together and then they came together in a space which had access, uh, uh, better internet access and they kind of, um, use that space to interact with the international uh, uh, space, uh, international global uh, internet agenda. We also had groups of people who wanted, like in this uh, webinar, to participate in the conference, in, in the forum, right? So we gave them what we called, quote unquote, connectivity, um, connectivity, uh, grants or subgrants, which enabled them to actually increase their uh, bandwidth or go again go to places where they could uh, come to get have a better connect connection. So I think that so those very simple and uh, not very difficult examples actually gave us the idea that we should actually try to do more of this. And so that's really one of the challenges that we have taken into this year, where we are trying to see how we can make these, inter these in uh, inter inter internet spaces more accessible to the people who don't have uh, this access, because we don't think that waltzing around the world, creating uh, in-person conferences is a good thing uh, anyway, not just because of Corona, but because of also climate change, all of that. Not sure I quite answered that, but I'm also, we are grappling with the situation right now. Ma'am, we have, we have covered all the questions that were posted in the chat box. So now, uh, do you want to tell anything more, ma'am? Okay, there's also a question. Uh, I guess the question is getting answered already. Uh, yes, I think already I did. Uh, yeah. Okay, so no, I don't. I hope I just left you with some stuff to think about uh, as you go into the rest of the conference and to go, you go back into your work. Uh, I'm very, once again, thank you very much. I was very privileged to be part of this space. Uh, and I really enjoyed the interactions with the organizers and they were very helpful. And yeah, so thank you very much and good luck for the rest of the conference. Thank you, ma'am, for answering these questions. And now we have come to the close of uh, this session. Now, I would like to invite Ms. Neeta Prasad, Assistant Professor, Department of English, LB College, to propose the vote of thanks. Thank you, Vera. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Am I okay. audible? Yes, ma'am. Okay, good. 
We have listening to the insightful lecture titled mm -hmm. Structural Inequalities of Technological Encounters by Ms. Sandy Fernando. The thought provoking words of our speaker par excellence, Ms. Sandy Fernando, recall to mind a slightly altered version of George Orwell's take on inequality. All human beings are equal, but some are more equal than others. The gender dimension of this rampant inequality is indeed confounding, as Ms. Sandy Fernando has pointed out. And women of the South, of the underdeveloped countries, being doubly marginalized, how to bear the brand of it. In a world of gendered hierarchies, some women can dream of conquering the universe, whereas some women can only dream of surviving each, pa each passing day. On behalf of each and everyone present here, for opening our eyes to the reality of the structural inequality than the vantage point of technology. It's been really wonderful listening to you, ma'am. I extend my thanks to Dr. Bindu Nair for that wonderful introduction and Ms. Meera for forbearing this exhibition. I also thank the team of Shivaji University and the team of SC College for organizing this wonderful conference. Thank you all once again. Thank you, Neetha, ma'am. With this, we come to the close of our third plenary session. Okay. Am I audible, ma'am? Yes, you are, Meera. Go ahead. Okay, ma'am. So now, we come to the close of the third plenary session. And I request all of you to stay back. And our technical session seven will begin soon in this platform. Technical sessions eight and nine we come in shortly and we will provide in the chat room and also in the telegram room. In these seven technical sessions, we have five micro presentations and on this chair, we have Professor Shakuntala Shukta, Department of Sociology and Director, Research Center for Women's Studies, Kanyatik University, Barba. Fourth and the last plenary session will be conducted at 1.30 p.m. Thank you all for your patient listening and your active participation. Thank you. Thank you, Veera. Thank you very much. Technical session 7 is in the same link, isn't it, Lena? Yeah, it's, it's in this, this link. So maybe we can wait, no? Because it's, I think it's due order. Such a wonderful talk. Yeah, it is really wonderful. Just as Rajeshwar said, we usually think about technology only as internet and phones and such things. But now she has opened up so many knowledge channels. At 11 a.m., Dana, there's still around 20 minutes. So maybe oh, then that will be better. So we'll leave the group and get back.
I yes. uh, I have taken a screenshot of you, ma'am. Okay, thank you so much, Prasidha, ma'am. <laughs> I can see you. Your video is off, I think. Okay, okay. Yes. <laughs> Here, children are here and there. They are starting TV, something else. So that oh, yeah. I have muted my audio, ma'am. Yeah, Prasidha, <laughs> how are you? Very happy to see you. Lena madam uh, Pratibha yes. is my student so i am very proud oh. of pratibha that is what <laughs> oh that's great that's yeah, great. that's a great thing <laughs> that's a great thing she yeah. has been doing very well yeah in uh, shivaji university mm -hmm. please ma'am uh, my daughter is seeing also then missing her yeah oh. okay yeah, yeah. Hi. hi hello hi hello hi, hello. hi. मलाला यूसुफ साई वन सेट आई रेस माई वॉइस नोट सो आई कैन शाउट बट सो दैट दो विदाउट अ वॉइस कैन बी हर्ड We cannot succeed when half of us are held back. I'm Shivapriya Jayaprakash, third-year BA English Literature student of SD College, Alappuzha. I welcome you all to the technical session seven of the two-day virtual international conference on gender studies post 1990s, technological encounters and narratives of empowerment, organized by the PG Department of English, Sanadana Dharma College, Alappuzha. in collaboration with beti bachao abhiyan department of students development shivaji university kolhapur maharashtra in this session we will have presentations of various papers on the thrust areas of gender studies that we have received from faculties research scholars and students from across the world that are sure to enrich our knowledge we have with us on the chair professor shakuntala shetar from the department of sociology and director research center for women studies karnatak university dharwad i welcome you ma'am to the session thank you thank you so much thank you very much the six paper presenters in this session are ms mita ek assistant professor department of economics government college madapalli vadagara dr prashant gaykwad research scholar from maharashtra ms asha ms high secondary school teacher Arvind Vidya Mandiram, Pali ke toda. Mr. Dadathre and Ravan, second M.S. student, Political Science Department, Shivaji University, Kolhapur. Dr. Deepa Ingavle, Assistant Professor, M.B. Unit, Department of Commerce and Management, Shivaji University, Kolhapur. And Ms. Suman Pandurang Yesne Patel, Research Scholar, Economics Department, Shivaji University, Kolhapur. I welcome you all to the session. before we move on i request all the participants to kindly turn off your audio and video to ensure better clarity please know that the time limit for each presentation is from 5 to 7 minutes to avoid overstepping the time limit also there will be an interactive session after all the papers are presented so all of you are requested to kindly stay till the end your questions can be posted in the comment section and please don't forget to mention the name of the paper presented to whom you are addressing yeah once again i will come you all to the session now i invite professor shakuntala shetar on the chair to make the introductory remarks and initiate the proceedings over to you ma'am yeah uh, thank you so much shukriya jay prakash um it's indeed a very great thing for me to participate in this uh, national conference virtual uh, international conference on gender issues gender studies post 1990s technological encounters and narratives of empowerment and this is organized by pg department of english sanatan dharma college alafuz and also beti bachao abhiyan department of students uh, development shivaji university kolhapur maharashtra i am really i am really very privileged to chair this session seven chair uh, seven uh session seventh session and it's uh, indeed a very fortunate for me to 
chair this session as well as to give certain uh, this on remarks on the on the trust theme of this conference of course you have already yesterday from yesterday you have already a rigorous uh, scholarship speeches lectures from a very prominent uh, scholars uh, from uh, abroad and uh, as well as uh, from uh, india also and uh, i congratulate all the organizers for uh, having selected such a very relevant theme uh, for this international conference and uh, of course i also uh, agree with the organizers that, that there is a lot of interaction that is taking place in uh, recent years uh, between uh, gender and uh, technology because after 1990s the technological advancement has you can say has almost drastically changed the every scene of uh, india and it has impacted the whole society and uh, including gender and gender has come under a very uh, this uh, acute impact of uh, this technology so on the one side the technology has brought out uh, has brought about uh, many uh, uh, many opportunities economic educational opportunities for women have opened up many new employment and other facilities and opportunities for women and at the other end it has also you can say uh, provided many technological and household technologies technologies that helped to improve their status and role in the family as well as in the society so in that you can say connection it is very important uh, to understand the linkage between gender and uh, this technology and uh, and also as we have seen that in recent years there has been many problems also created out of this technology Uh, especially some of the problems most of the problems uh, of modern period they are related to more women compared to the men so that is why in that connection uh, this uh, intricate relationship between understanding the relationship between technology and gender has become very important and we have seen that women have been facing have been facing in spite of all the development uh, focus the development plans in india especially in india women have been facing lot of problems and uh, discriminations and inequalities uh, though we have uh, we have uh, uh, women have surpassed in many uh, fields of uh, development still you can say there are many problems modern problems that have creeped in indian society for women out of technology also so uh, that is why the government the civil society and uh, and also the academics and in universities institutions have been we can say working together to uh, to improve the situation and to understand uh, the to bring you can say awareness and empowerment uh, especially the marginalized group of women group of uh, women Uh, so in that you can say connection so we have uh, uh, we have here the six papers in this session six papers in this session to address the different issues of gender and gender inequality and also uh, the the programs uh, given by the uh, the programs launched by the government of india the that is a beti bachao and beti padhao campaign in india so the, the, there are two papers which are concentrating on this issue beti bachao and beti padhao uh, campaign uh, the effect of this uh, campaign uh, uh, campaign on uh, girls especially on girls in india and also we have uh, uh, two three more papers on uh, gender responsive budgeting which is a very you can say important step a milestone for the empowerment of uh, women which has been introduced uh, from the 2000 uh, from um, uh, 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 from 2007 onwards this gender responsive budgeting has been introduced by the government of india so that has been a very favorable positive step in the empowerment of uh, women and also we have this beti bachao program uh, since uh, two, uh, 2015 so we have seen a lot of changes among especially among the rural people because of this uh, program so that is why we have here um, uh, some uh, we have here six papers uh, to present uh, in this session and one more paper we have is a gender inequality in panchayat uh, uh, 
village members in uh, in a village mem uh, in a members so that's a very important you can say issue uh, that we are concerned even today because a lot of we can say uh, efforts have been made by the government of india to uh to include or to increase the participation of uh, women in political fields by uh, through the panchayat raj institutions uh, so uh, that uh, uh, that has provided almost you can say 50% in some states of india 50% of reservation to women but in spite of uh, all the reservation and uh, women you can say participation as elected members in uh, village panchayats still you can say there are many um, hidden you can say hidden problems so that has come in the way of the uh, the uh, the uh, the effective participation of uh, women in india so that is why there are uh, six papers which are addressing uh, different issues of gender technology and also empowerment and inequality so uh, with these certain uh, remarks uh, as shupriya jay prakash has already given a time so each paper uh, presenter uh, is given uh, is given 10 minutes 10 minutes for presentation and i request all the paper presenters to stick on to the uh, this uh, time and uh, the presentation should be limited uh, to your uh, objectives introduction objectives methodology and also uh, methodology findings and discussion and suggestions so you restrict uh, to these points and uh, that and also uh, time adherence so with these few words i over to shupriya jay prakash and uh, um, paper presenters the I, i would like to call upon the first paper presenter smita okay smita um smita e e k who is assistant professor department of economics government college madapalli otakara uh, who is going to present her paper on gender responsive budgeting and development of women in kerala so over to smita shupriya can you hear me Shupriya yes ma'am I, yeah. uh, I think she is not present here at the moment yeah uh, then uh, shall i call prashant gaikwad ma'am Ma uh, just give uh, a minute to me please okay okay मैम can you hear me ma'am yeah sure sure yes my topic is gender responsive budgeting and development of women in kerala and gender equality and empowerment of women are essential for achieving economic development of a nation mainly because women constitute half percentage of the population and women who are presently lag behind the male counterpart in terms of education health earnings and work participation rate and also in terms of decision making and also there exist wide gender inequality uh, which is reflected in india's position in global gender gap index india ranked while 112th position out of 142 countries in terms of global gender gap index in 
and this figure was one, this rank was 108th position during the year 2019 and this figure which shows the various forms of vulnerability faced by women and children throughout their life period and there is a rising trend of violence against women in multiple forms domestic violence rape trafficking child abuse sexual harassment and lack of safety in public places and while traveling and in order to tackle the violence against women and also to ensure gender equality the specific policy intervention of government is required and gender responsive budgeting is one such initiative undertaken by the government and here gender responsive budgeting is a method of looking at the budget formulation process budgetary policies and budget outlays from the gender lens and grb looks at the government budget from a gender perspective to assess how it address the needs of women in the areas of health education employment etc because the needs of men and women are different and this gender responsive budgeting is known by different names gender sensitive budget gender responsive budget women budget and so on it is not a separate budget for women and this gender responsive budgeting was firstly implemented by the australian government in the year 1984 for ensuring gender mainstreaming and also women empowerment and today most of the countries follow this strategy for women development and in india india indian government initiated this gender responsive budgeting 2005 onwards and the union budget 2005 2006 for the first time implemented included a separate gender budgeting statement and different countries adopted different method methodologies for assessing the gender responsiveness of the budget and in india the methodology developed by national institute of public finance and taxation and gender budgeting statement in india consists of two part part a and part b part a consists of programs which are specially meant for women that is 100 percentage women specific allocation and part b that is pro women specific allocation that is those programs and schemes at least where at least 30 percentage of the allocation is for women and in kerala Kerala has won a tremendous achievement in the field of health and education but these achievements have had no impact on gender status in Kerala gender responsive budgeting introduced at the local level in the year 1998 by allocating 10 percentage of the plan fund for women specific schemes and at the state level in 2008 government has introduced gender responsive budgeting by introducing gender intensive allocations and here the basic objective of this paper is to analyze the trend and magnitude of budgetary allocation for women specific schemes in kerala from 2008-9 to 2021-22 and this data is collected from the budget document of government of kerala and the gender budgeting statement of government of kerala and this this table shows the budgetary allocation for women specific schemes in kerala from 2008-9 to 2020-21 and we can see that year after year the budgetary allocation for women specific scheme are continuously increasing but it is less than 1% of the total budget allocation when we compare this figure with the actual budget actual budget expenditure we can say that the actual expenditure is always less than budget estimate which means that uh, the government did not give much importance to the gender specific fund utilization and here again women specific programs implemented in kerala are categorized into the programs under the head education purpose uh, gender awareness program and social security program and livelihood generation program and these are the major program implemented by the government for uh, improving the health and nutritional status of women in kerala sidalayam that is uh, health care center women specific health care center and janani janma reksha nutrition program for adults and girls 
Indira Gandhi, Madhurtu Sahayogi Yojana, then Pradhan Mantri, Madhuru Vantana Yojana. These are all the programs, centrally sponsored program and the state sponsored program implemented in Kerala for improving the health status. And these are the livelihood generation programs in Kerala. As we know, Kudumbasri is the most important fund allocating program for women program. Then self-employment scheme for registered widows, deserted and unwedded mother and uh, extension of Kudumbasri in tribal areas and the program of Thira Maitri and Mahila Choir Yojana and women development program, flagship program of finishing school. Then in infrastructural facilities, infrastructural facilities basically meant for improving the women friendly infrastructure that is construction of women hostel, then nearby home and construction of restroom. Those are all for, uh, for providing women friendly amenities. And a lot of programs implemented by the government of Kerala for ensuring social security. That is the most important one is women welfare, women's commission, then contribution of social welfare board, grant for ABEA, then the program of Snehas Parsham, then uh, Kerala State Women Development Corporation, then One Stop Center, Sodarge Women Counseling Center, Jwala Scheme. A lot of program implemented under the head social security and welfare. And also uh, 14 departments in Kerala have implemented gender awareness pro programs, police department, public work department, education, sports, arts and culture, medical and public health department. Then also social welfare department also implementing this gender awareness program. Then for educational purpose, we have Beti Bachao, Beti Padao, then uh, Women Polytechnic, National Scheme for Incentive to Girl Child for Secondary Education, then Scholarship for Nadar and Muslim Women, then again Financial Assistance for Higher Education to the Children of Widows. When we analyze the category-wise and percentage-wise share of this program, to women specific scheme, we can rightly say that importance is given to livelihood generation program. Here again, in this livelihood generation program, most of the fund allocating program is Kudumbasri. And also it is followed by women welfare and sec social security. 18.7 percentage of the fund is allocated for women welfare and social security. And also for health, uh, rising the health status, 14 percentage of the women specific scheme, uh, women specific funds are allocated. And in the case of education purpose, the fund uh, is gradually declining. And this one is the share of Kudumbasri Women's Welfare and Kerala State Women Development Corporation in women specific schemes. Uh, Kudumbasri is the topmost fund allocating program and it is followed by Kerala Women's Welfare, a large number of program under the head, under the demand for head women welfare and a lot of programs also implemented by Kerala State Women Development Corporation, but the fund allocation for that program is very less. And pro women specific scheme, which is at least 30 percentage of the allocation and benefit reserved for women and in pro women specific scheme the fund allocation is larger out of the total gender budgeting allocation 87 percentage of the fund is for part b as a conclusion we can rightly say that uh, by providing budgetary fund to women program Gender budgeting bridges the gap that exists between men and women. And also there is a positive sign that we can see in the last uh, latest periodic labor force survey report during the year 2018-19, where the work participation rate of women is increasing. And in Kerala, it is higher than the national average. It is now around 20.4 percentage. And at the national level, it is only 17.6 percentage. So gender responsive budgeting is helpful for women empowerment. And as an essential tool for strengthening women, uh, government should adopt active measure to make the budget more and more gender responsive. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Smita. Uh, yeah, uh, now the paper uh, is kept for discussion. Uh, if you have any doubts or problems or uh, questions to ask, um, you can uh, put in the chat box or
you can ask supriya uh, ma'am i think we'll have the interactive session after all the papers are presented yeah okay okay sure sure then i'll call upon uh, the second uh, paper presenter prashant gaikwad youth and uh, his paper is uh, on youth and gender in india and he is a phd scholar in uh, one of the universities in maharashtra uh, i don't know because uh, it's not clear here um, so now i call upon uh, prashant gaikwad to present to make his presentation Shupriya, ma'am, I think he is not present here at the moment. I think we shall move on to the next one. Next paper presenter, okay? Asha, how about Asha? Yes, ma'am. Asha is there. Yeah, Asha is there. Okay. So, Asha, um, please present your paper on gender digital divide in rural India. The time, as I have said already, the time given to you is ten uh, minutes, twelve minutes, of course, because. Uh, one more uh, prashant we don't have you can take your own time 12 minutes yeah thank you ma'am sure uh, yeah okay okay yeah. okay i will good morning yes thank you ma'am good morning everyone my name is asha ms and i am currently working as a high secondary school teacher in arvinda vidya mandiram which is in kottayam okay so the topic that i have selected for the conference is gender digital divide in rural parts of india so as we all know gender digital divide is defined as gender biases coded into technology products technology sector and digital skills education gender inequalities remain as a serious issue in the digital economy as there's the gap between urban and rural populations Globally, the proportion of men using the internet in 2017 was 12 percent higher than women, says the International Telecommunication Union, which is the United Nations Agency. So, what is the condition in India? The shocking reality of India's digital divide came into light tragically in June this year when a 14-year-old girl died by suicide in Kerala. she was distressed over not having access to any digital device to attend her online lessons so while the above is a tragic example of india's digital divide in educational access in general it is important to know that this digital divide is further marked by severe gender disparity when the nation was confronted with the prospect of large scale remote digital education on account of covid 19 the gender digital divide was exposed in a stark manner so this review aims at addressing the following questions to what extent do women in rural areas use ict and what are the hindrances or barriers for internet access what are the benefits of uh, for rural women to have access to the internet and what are the measures to reduce gender digital gap in rural parts of india okay and the present study used secondary information to arrive at a meaningful analysis of the issue of gender digital divide and the secondary information was collected from journals newspapers and books on the relevant topic as analyzing the results it is understood that a lot of initiatives were undertaken by various organizations to empower rural women in the digital world but these proposed solutions have not been tested empirically to determine how far the rural women advance towards using these technologies for the improvement of their lives and more research is still needed in this uh, space so the internet facilities are used mainly by young people and only by a minority of women and women in management positions generally between 40 and 50 years of age often viewed technology as alien or used it only through the help from their children middle aged women who work in villages panchayats railway booking counters and especially teachers find it hard to use smartphones or computers effectively initially you know the technology was a male dominated field but with the increasing involvement of urban women 
over the years, the usage of technology has increased among them. And urban women have achieved a greater level of self-reliance when compared to rural women. And one of the reasons for this disparity is the rural women's literacy rate lower than that of urban women. And we can look at the uh, on the barriers such as gender discrimination, lack of confidence, language and difficulties, low literacy and lack of time and money continue to prevent girls and young women from taking full advantage of technology. In rural parts of the country, women have limited or no access to technology because of societal norms, poor economic condition or being in unconnected areas. And most of them do not even own a mobile phone. A survey conducted in semi-rural Madhya Pradesh revealed that a majority of the women are unable to read or write, could not dial a number or read messages, and most did not know their mobile numbers even and had to ask their husbands. So their cell phone usage was mostly limited to pressing the green button when the phone rang. And what are some benefits for rural women if they have access to the internet? Digital access helps women learn vocational skills by taking online classes in agriculture, textile design, improve their financial literacy, keep up with government programs that benefit their families, and learn about nutrition. They can use the smartphone to be connected with the market to sell their products and to access different types of information like health and hygiene. There are women in rural areas going from door to door asking people if they would require any banking facility or e-governance services. And one such person was Janaki Devi, an internet savvy from Guna in Madhya Pradesh, says that women come to her to find out about a variety of things like exam results, job opportunities, and even cashless transactions. The measures which is to reduce gender digital gap in rural parts of India. And there are so many initiatives undertaken by various organizations to offer digital help to women in rural India. And one such initiative is Internet Savvy by Google India to make women acquainted with the online platform. The initiative Internet Sati developed local women trainers or Internet Satis to train other women on how to use the Internet, which in turn helps them improve their income and overall quality of life. The Arogya Sakhi Home Based Antenatal and Infancy Care Program trains women health entrepreneurs from communities in resource poor rural areas to provide home based preventive care perform diagnostic tests and screen for high risk factors and ensure early referral during antenatal and infancy period. Arogya Sahi are supported by a mobile application that guides them through the care process, helps identify high risk signs and symptoms and gives alerts regarding the need for referral. And Digital India is a campaign launched by the government of India under the leadership of Honorable Prime Minister Mr. Narendra Modi in order to ensure that government services are made available to citizens electronically by improved online infrastructure and by increasing in internet connectivity. It helps in building a community of women who see the potential of a mobile phone changing their lives. Even though technology offers a large amount of information, adaptation of content to meet local needs, languages, and situations often remains as a challenge. Hence, content should be adapted to local languages and made accessible to the women in rural India. School is often the first place where children are introduced to technology as well as learning the literacy and numeracy skills to make the most of these digital tools. Therefore, we must ensure girls and women have equal access to learning relevant technical skills and digital literacy in school and through training programs to be able to take advantage of technology and digital tools. And social norms, lack of connectivity and poverty are some of the reasons that rural women have less access to ICTs. Technology-oriented programs are being conducted in rural India for the benefit of women, but the projects are not successful because of the lack of infrastructure provided for the upliftment of women in rural areas. 
So to conclude, I would like to say that there is still a long way to go. There are certain challenges, including availability and affordability of smartphones to individual differences in acquiring digital skills. Some women forget what they learn from their trainers if they do not have continued access to personal smartphones. And effective solutions need to be made in order to ensure that women who have undergone training have access to smartphones. We need to tackle social taboos, inspiring village communities to modify their behavior and change their mindsets towards women as mere commodities or housemates. Uh, thank you all. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Asha. Uh, it's a very nice presentation. And uh, next, uh, and you and will be discussed at the end of the paper, all the presentations. Sure, ma'am. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, next, uh, I would like to call upon uh, the Tatri Yen Ravan. Okay. So, he is, uh, the title of his paper is A Study of Beti Bachao and Beti Padao Campaign in India. He is there. Datatri, Narayan. No, ma'am, I don't see his name. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we'll move on to the uh, yeah. next paper. Okay. Uh, Dr. Deepa. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, now I invite you for your presentation on Beti Bachao, Beti Padao campaign in India, a social mar marketing perspective. Okay. okay. Or to... Yes. Deepa. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Deepa Indoble from Shivaj University, Kolhapur. I'm going to make a presentation on Betty Bachao, Betty Padao campaign in India, a social marketing perspective. So here, the paper deals with how the social marketing concepts are applied to Betty Bachao, Betty Padao campaign in India. So let us start the discussion. First, I will give a brief idea regarding social marketing. So social marketing is the use of marketing techniques to spread socially beneficial ideas or behaviors. Social marketing activities are executed on a non-profit basis by social, governmental, religious or political organizations for the benefit of the society. The second aspect is regarding the declining child sex ratio. The gender composition in India has worsened over a period of time in past few years. India has seen continuous decline in sex ratio for various reasons. Males have been given away the more preference over females in India due to various reasons. That may include the male is treated as asset while female as liability. The second may be the patriarchal families, dowry system, high expenditure of marriage, atrocity against women, etc. Therefore, the government has enacted and brought the PCPNDT Act to prevent the sex determination of the fetus in 1994. Despite of the efforts, laws, and actions taken by the government as well as the non-government organizations, there is decreasing child sex ratio. Government as well as, therefore, the government as well as non-government organizations are promoting the girl-child acceptance through various campaigns. The major objective of these campaigns is to stop sex determination and female forticide. 
and to change the attitude of people towards girl child acceptance government has announced beti bachao beti padhao initiative to address this issue various programs are conducted under this initiative at central level at state level as well as at the regional level to increase the girl child acceptance the objectives of this paper is to study the beti bachao beti padhao campaigns in india second is to assess the social marketing perspective used in implementing the beti bachao beti padhao campaigns research methodology used for the present paper is the exploratory research design for which secondary data are used and this data is collected from the television and internet advertisement newspapers and internet now let us discuss regarding the social marketing perspective to beti bachao beti padhao program so here the social marketing programs we can see the social marketing programs can be developed with the help of different aspects like situation analysis target market analysis developing the product pricing place and promotion now we are going to see these aspects from the point of view of the beti bachao beti padhao program so this is related to the uh beti bachao beti padhao program and how the social marketing concepts can be used or already used in this program so first is analysis of the situation and the issues involved before developing any social marketing program a comprehensive research is required in order to gain vital knowledge about the issues involved India has seen continuous decline in sex ratio for various reasons males have been given preference over females in India due to various causes, causes which we have already seen in the earlier discussions second aspect regarding the social marketing is target market analysis here there is a need to understand who are the target audiences or who are the target market social marketing organizations required to know the target market for the social product target marketing enables social marketer to concentrate their efforts to target audience in case of the social issue concerning girl child acceptance the broad segment is the whole society therefore the communication programs are telecasted on the mass media nationwide specifically target group includes married couples and their family members particularly parents who have the influence on their decisions at national level different target groups are identified for the beti bachao beti padhao program to name some few a one group may be the poor people who are not able to raise their girl child the another group is the people with low literacy level the geographical area are also identified where child sex ratio is worse which serves as another target group so likewise the target market analysis has been done for the particular social problem the third aspect of social marketing is developing the product in social marketing ideas behaviors are the products to be marketed in india male dominates the society and there are many cases where the female child is killed before birth here government is promoting the message that female child is equal to male child and they are communicating this message with social marketing campaign and want a change in people's behavior or attitude government has implemented different schemes under beti bachao beti padhao program like sukanya samruddhi yojana kanya jagruti scheme in punjab then largely in haryana bhagya lakshmi scheme then beti hai anmol scheme in himachal pradesh etc at the regional level the critical districts where child sex ratio is low 
different programs like rallies quiz competition public meetings painting elocution rangoli and other competitions are organized to create the awareness as well as to change the behavior towards girl child acceptance the fourth aspect is regarding the place most social marketing products are in the form of intangible services or communication packages change in behavior with respect to girl child acceptance is intangible and are distributed either through media or through doctors volunteers social workers and non governmental organizations different schemes and programs are developed at different geographical locations like states or the regional level considering the cultural and behavioral aspects of the people in that particular area the fifth aspect regarding social marketing is pricing pricing is the cost the target market associates with adopting the desired behavior in case of social marketing their change in behavior is expected non monetary cost such as time effort and energy needs to be spent price for the girl child acceptance is psychological and emotional cost the last point is the promotion social product or idea is presented in the form of communication package government has spent majority of its funds allocated to a uh, beti bachao beti padhao program scheme on advertisement central government has spent around rupees 364 crore on the advertisement since 2014 print audio video advertisements are displayed in various media like newspaper radio television social media etc so we can observe the various advertisement on these different platforms coming towards the conclusion of this paper beti bachao beti padhao campaign was launched to increase the girl child acceptance and to improve child sex ratio to maintain the balance in the society from the above discussion it can be concluded that beti bachao beti padhao campaigns were implemented at the different levels to communicate the message to different stakeholders campaigns are developed considering the situations at the different geographical areas through these campaigns awareness has been generated amongst the people regarding the issue but still the child sex ratio is decreasing as discussed above there are different facets to the girl child acceptance therefore there is a need deal with the other associated issues like patriarchal system dowry system women safety crime against women etc these issues can be resolved by strict enactment of the law and by creating awareness and responsiveness integrated social change campaigns needs to be developed considering the associated social issues to change the attitude and perception of the society towards the social cause thank you everyone for patient listening thank you deepa uh, very nice presentation so you are trained in uh, mba and yes, uh, yeah mba and you are as, uh, assistant professor in the department of commerce and management yes. shivaji university and very okay. nice presentation from uh, um, your uh, um, this knowledge from that you got from mba degree okay. yeah you have presented a very we have established a very good linkage between uh, this program and uh, um, uh, the social market concept okay thank you very much thank you ma'am yeah uh, now i'd like to call upon suman esme suman esme is there she is there suman 
Ma'am, she had informed us that she was facing certain technical issues, and at present she is not yeah. here. She is not here. Yeah. yeah. Then uh, what about Prashant? Prashant has also not presented paper. Yeah, he also informed that he won't present his paper. You want to present his paper, okay? Ma'am, there is a message in the common box. Yeah. So, uh, good morning, one and all. Uh, here is Suman Esne from Economics Department, Shivaji University, Kolhapur. I am a research scholar, ma'am. Yes, uh, Sneha. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my name is Suman Esne, actually, but due to the uh, email ID, it can be shown as uh, Sneha Patil. Okay? Yes. okay. So, uh, the title of my topic is... Um, Gender inequality in a village panchayat finances, uh, sorry, village panchayat in Azra Tarsi. So, uh, because of some technical issues of electricity, I couldn't uh, show the uh, PPT, uh, which is on uh, laptop. So, I just uh, summarized the topic in short, okay? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, in <laughs> India, panchayat raj generally uh, refers to the system of local self-government in India introduced by the constitutional amendment in 1992. Uh, actually, it is based on the traditional panchayat system of South Asia. Uh, the panchayat raj system was formalized in 1992 uh, to, uh, for the Indian Committee on Various Ways for Implementing uh, Decentralized Administration. Okay, So the... Uh, Modern Panchayati Raj and uh, Gram Panchayats are not uh, to be uh, extra constitutional ways. So, in India, Panchayat Raj uh, functioning uh, as a system of governance in which Gram Panchayats are the basic unit of local administration. And uh, in the that system, there are three levels that is, Gram Panchayat at villages level, uh, then Mandal Parishad or Black block committee at uh, panchayat committee or block level and jilla parishad at district level and it was formalized in 1992 by the amendment of 73rd amendment in indian constitution now um, what is mean uh, why there is important to study the role of the woman in panchayat raj system in a 73rd amendment uh, it is because uh, uh, in 73rd amendment the majority of the uh, reservation which was given to women uh, for the empowerment of women and because of that the role of the uh, women in panchayat raj system it was increased but uh, it is only on the um, um, uh, physical basis but their active participation in panchayat raj we should not found in uh, every uh, where and uh, uh, reservation for women in Panchayat Raj institution in India was given on August 27, 2009. The Union Cabinet of uh, the Government of India approved 50% reservation for women in Panchayat Raj institution. Uh, and uh, that was basically implemented in Andhra Pradesh, Bihar, Chhattisgarh, Himachal Pradesh, Dharkand and Kerala, Karnataka, Madhya Pradesh, Maharashtra, Orissa and Rajasthan. So, uh, um, the study area which was selected by me uh, is uh, basically from the uh, Maharashtra state in which there is the Kolhapur district and Azra Tarsil which was selected. While whenever we are uh, uh, studied to entire uh, panchayat statistics, the number of uh, panchayat, raj, panchayat raj in uh, India is, it is 2,55,805. Out of that, number of gram panchayats are 2,48,901 and block panchayats are 6,306 and number of district panchayats are 598. So among that uh, uh, overall uh, panchayat raj, the number of elected uh, members are uh, 31 lakh and out of that only 40 lakhs are the representative of the elected women. So even though um, by the constitution 50% reservation which was given to women for their uh, uh, enrollment in the uh, village panchayat, then also out of that reservation, 
फिफ्टी पर्सेंट लेस देन फिफ्टी पर्सेंट आर वुमन एक्चुअली इलेक्टेड एंड नाउ वेन एवर वी आर स्टडिंग द रोल ऑफ द वुमन इन पंचायत एक्टिव पार्टिसिपेशन देन वी आर फाउंड दैट देर आर वेरियस डिफिकल्टीज इट मीन्स दैट वाइल वी आर स्टडी द स्टैटिस्टिक्स वी फाउंड दैट देर आर वेरियस प्रॉब्लम्स इन वुमेन पार्टिसिपेशन इन पंचायत राज सिस्टम बिकॉज दे फेल पंचायत राज सिस्टम हैज फेल टू मिस यूज एंड मैन्युपुलेट बाय द लोकल पॉवर प्रोकर्स टू द वुमन एंड दैट्स वाय सेकेंड थिंग दैट इज इग्नोरेंस ऑफ वुमन अबाउट देयर लाइफ the their uh, potential and responsible uh, responsibilities are not uh, utilized in the local bodies and it is very doubtful that mere increase in the number of uh, seats uh, for women in local uh, bodies to increase participation of women it is required but unless structural changes are brought about the uh, sincere efforts uh, to educate the women and the power structure existing in the rural areas it is not possible to uh, uh, actually implement of the uh, women's potential uh, and their uh, uh, potential uh, capacity to util uh, develop the uh, village concept so which are the problems uh, i have found in my study is that there is the uh, women who who are facing the problems uh, Uh, in conducting the um, representativeness in the panchayat raj system is that illiteracy and low education level of the majority of the women elected women we are found there then second thing that is overburdened with the their family responsibility so they don't have enough uh, time uh, to do um, uh, work for the village panchayat third problem uh, which was faced by the women is that introversion due to the lack of communication skills next thing that is poor socio economic background with which the women have uh, come into the system and poor capacity building fourth thing that is male family members and also the leaders from the caste group or community come in the way of the affairs of the panchayat and that's why it is become hurdle uh, for women Uh, to do active participation in village panchayat next problem which was faced by the uh, women uh, representative um, who are working in village panchayats are the indifferent attitude and behavior of official working system that means that now also male dominated culture uh, is found everywhere so the there is the um, approach to treat the women representative is different from the officials level also next thing that is the misguidance by the local bureaucracy and uh, because of that all that things there is the problem uh, facing by the village panchayat women for their active participation now how we can solve uh, uh, to increase the um, participation of women among that uh, uh, the there is the proper guidance or the uh, there is the uh, awareness program for the training uh, orientation come training programs uh, organized for the uh, panchayat members especially for women should be encouraged by which way it is possible to um, villages uh, that they should do their active participation in economically poor people and can also participation in this training programs next thing that is uh, the uh, there is the dependence upon men uh, uh, for the women it should be reduced uh, by the way of uh, giving uh, means increase their uh, feelings uh, their their in uh, independence men in all kinds of uh, public participation and the primary responsibilities of women uh, for looking after home and children um, should be uh, somewhat um, reduced uh, by which way their uh, share in uh, or their participation can be public work can be increased next thing that there is no uh, there is another uh, major problem with the women representatives that um, they should not cope up with the 
मेल मेंबर्स हु आर इलेक्टेड इन द विलेज पंचायत सो वी शुड इट शुड इफ इट इज पॉसिबल टू इन्क्रीज द कॉन्फिडन्स अमंग द वुमन टू इन्क्रीज देअर एटिट्यूडिनल चेंजेस थ्रू द ट्रेनिंग प्रोग्राम्स इफ इट इज पॉसिबल देन देअर रोल शुड बी इन्क्रीजेस देन अगेन मेल डॉमिनेटेड पॉवर स्ट्रक्चर इन द विलेजेस शुड बी शुड नॉट एक्सेप्टेड बाय द वुमन सो इफ that uh, male dominated uh, culture is not uh, psychologically accepted by the women then it is possible to increase their uh, role in the active participation in village culture so uh, that are only the papers which i want to uh, present thanks for the organization organizers organizers who are giving me an opportunity to participation and present some present some thoughts uh, related to that topic in this uh, conference thank you thank you yeah thank you very much sneha patil Uh, for your presentation on uh, political participation of uh, women and gender inequality in village panchayats um, um now uh are there uh, there is uh, uh, one more paper presenter prashant gayakwad um whether he is going to present paper or not or uh, shall we wind up Uh, ma'am he has informed that he won't present his paper dr prashant gekwa yeah and there is one more uh, the tatrin raven he had joined at the start of the session but left shortly after and yeah. hasn't turned up since so i think with your permission we may, we may move on to the discussion part yeah yeah okay sure so now we will move on to discussion so if uh, um, any problems any uh, things to add to the present papers uh you are most welcome all the world audience are most welcome now all the papers are kept for discussion shubhriya we haven't received any question Yeah, so not seen any questions in the chat box. No, ma'am, not yet. Yeah, okay. We'll wait for some time. Yes, ma'am. Shubhriya, we haven't received any questions yet, ma'am. Yeah. Okay. Shall I wind up or what? I think we'll wait for a few more minutes, or you may yeah. ask certain questions if you wish to. <laughs> yeah. Sure. I uh, I would like to ask one question to Smita. Smita, Smita. Um, okay, ma'am, yeah. I'm here. 
Oh. Yeah, Smita. So you have uh, presented your paper on uh, gender responsive budgeting, okay? Yes. And development okay. of women in Karnataka. It's uh, in Kerala, ma'am. Yeah, sorry, in Kerala. Sorry, in Kerala. Um, but I we know that uh, Kerala stands at uh, highest at the uh, development indicators. So it has high literacy, high work, female work participation, high sex ratio uh, means. Uh, Uh, more uh, uh, female population, uh, more work participation. So, in all as in all indicators of social development, Kerala, you can say Kerala scores better than other states in India. Okay, uh, but as far as as you have seen, gender responsive budget, uh, budgetary policies are concerned. You have mentioned that very less importance. and uh, this allocation is uh, you can say meant for gender related uh, uh, welfare programs so uh, what is the this paradox that we see at one hand kerala a very highly developed state and at the other hand we see uh, when it comes to the gender related problems so we have seen even today uh, such you can say sensitive problems gender sensitive problems are there in Ken in kerala so what about your opinion in this connection yes ma'am you are correct yeah. uh, that is kerala yeah. is really a model to other states of india yeah, yeah. in of, uh, yeah. in kerala we can see high physical quality of life index high uh, yeah. female literacy rate high sex ratio is high yeah. uh, mm. then but at the same time the work participation rate of female is very low in kerala work especially the urban yeah. work urban female work participation is rate is very low but at the same time uh, the educated female literacy rate is very high in kerala as we can see yeah. the paradox high literacy rate but at the same time low work participation rate among work women part. yes mm -hmm. then again a uh, lot of uh, women specific programs introduced by the government of kerala but at the same time we can see that there is uh, less continuity of these programs mm -hmm. then and less number of programs for improving the skill development and at the same time for improving the work participation rate of female in kerala and this program of kudumbasri and also the program of mgnr ets is for unskilled laborers mainly mm. focusing on unskilled laborers so and again and further policy intervention on the part of government is essential for improving the status of women yeah yeah still you need uh, more programs for strengthening the empowerment of uh, women in kerala yes yes ma'am yeah. yeah this is what uh, we want uh, the root change huh? changes in the at the uh, heart at the root um, of the society because the structural discrimination even today continued even in kerala also so uh, though the education has uh, the 100% literacy has achieved but uh, the um, uh, uh, the uh, the structural inequalities of patriarchy so that continued you can say in kerala also and so the this is impacted their work participation because low work participation indicates their low status so though they are educated they are they don't want to work outside so they don't want to utilize their education so this means that the the such that patriarchal values structural inequalities so they are still you can say present in kerala do you agree with me okay ma'am yeah okay yeah um okay um shupriya shupriya yes ma'am yeah i would no, like yeah i would like to this suggest uh, um give my um uh, Uh, what ideas or uh, some of my contributions and some of my 
um, uh, uh, this uh, opinions about the papers which have already presented in this uh, session. I would like to take just five to ten minutes. Is it okay? Shupriya? Yes, ma'am. We have time till twelve thirty p.m. Yes. Uh, okay. 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 Shupriya, um, mm, I'll begin. Uh, so we have uh, just now you have heard uh, the presentation of uh, uh, six papers in this session, five papers in this session, and uh, I'm uh, very happy uh, to uh, to heard uh, all the papers paper presentation. and uh, i appreciate uh, their uh, uh, skill in presenting the paper and also as well as the content of the paper and uh, first let me begin with uh, the first paper smita smita uh, who has presented uh, her paper on the title gender responsive budgeting and development of women in kerala of course agree with uh, uh, smita that uh, india stands the position among 142 countries in gender gap index uh, and she has uh, mentioned in her uh, presentation about the importance of uh, budgetary policies or gender budgets gender or government budget at gender lens gender lens so that is a gender responsive budgeting which uh, have been implemented in india from 2005 and 6 of course kerala even earlier it has implemented this gender budgeting uh, policies and uh, as she has mentioned in her uh, paper that uh, uh, though there are many state and central sponsored programs for women and a lot of funds are uh, meant for the welfare of women still you can say very less importance uh, was uh, given to gender responsive budgeting in care and the actual expenditure is lesser than the sanctioned budget so that is the uh, actual you can say fate in kerala though lot of we can say budget was sanctioned uh, for uh, for women schemes for women related schemes but the actual expenditure is less than that so that shows the uh, the how the bureaucracies have been less inclined have been less uh, taken less interest in the development of uh, women and uh, as uh, i uh, her as, uh, from her presentation i came to know that uh, that livelihood programs uh, they were given more importance uh, more importance in kerala uh, so uh, uh, the, in that you can say respect uh, all the state and central sponsored programs should aim at improving the work participation yeah you work participation even among the educated uh, women because i heard that uh, though women are educated in kerala they don't want to take up the employment uh, at the uh, higher levels so they don't uh, they don't want to accept uh, the higher level employment opportunities so th th that is the uh, something that is uh, uh, very uh, Uh, important issue uh, to look from the development point of view so how we can say we can establish the relationship between education and development in that uh, context so uh, in that respect smita's paper is a very good uh, very good uh, contribution uh, to understand the linkage between gender and uh, technology and also gender responsive budgeting so thank you smita and coming to the next paper asha ms okay she has presented her paper on gender digital divide in rural india and uh, she in her uh, paper uh, she she uh, uh, she uh, pa paper she wants to uh, pre this present uh, know the status of rural women with reference to their access and use of technology for making their development and uh, awareness okay so this was the aim of her paper to know how what is the status of rural women with reference to the access and use of technology how rural women have been using and accessing the technology 
and uh, right she has rightly pointed out that rural women have a very less access to technology compared to the urban women of course uh, this has a multifarious impact a uh, negative impact on the empowerment of rural women development of rural women and she has also pointed out uh, certain measures certain uh, measures and certain problems you can say certain problems for, for the access of uh, technology for rural women so rural women you can say are uh, illiterate and uh, they are ignorant and uh, they live in poverty so they don't you can say have an access to uh, all the a uh, technological uh, uh, technological uh, measures uh, to improve their uh, status as a resident so that is why uh, i endorsed her views uh, in her conclusion what she said is uh, local language should be uh, should be language friendly uh, the language uh, should be language friendly the technology uh, should be language friendly and should be if they are provided in the local language local language then you can say that is uh, very much helpful for the rural women and also in uh, schools also such digital literacy should be introduced from the school level to impart such education to girls girls so that is the another very important suggestion uh, uh, which has been made by uh, asha and also she has also you can say mentioned in the in the last of her presentation that is the changing mindset of the people uh, the social norms and lack lack of uh, this connectivity that should be you can say uh, improved and that should be changed in order to change the mindset of the people so uh, girls and uh, women should be you can say an easy access to uh, the technologies then only you can say Uh, it will help in their empowerment so that is uh, asha she has uh, made presentation on beti bachao and beti padhao campaign in india from a social marketing uh, perspective a uh, very nice presentation and uh, 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 she has uh, you can say used uh, she has uh, uh, this uh, presented uh, her paper on uh, the use of social market concepts in padao campaign in india so of course uh, this campaign has uh, started in 2006 uh, 2005 and 6 in india and it has uh, you can say drastically made uh, changes in uh, india uh, to stop sex determination and female feticide and bring awareness among people to improve child sex ratio etc so in that uh, connection this program has been very successful uh, uh, successful in creating awareness among the people and as uh, the kolapur university or shivaji university have this uh, program uh, which has been conducting by the student uh, development department uh, which has been very active in creating awareness among the Uh, students girl students uh, in, uh, girl students and uh, providing many facilities to the girl students and uh, women uh, so uh, so uh, this, uh, this uh, deepa in her presentation uh, she has uh, made it clear that all the social market concepts have been already used in this uh, beti bachao and beti padhao program so uh, for example she has mentioned about the target market analysis developing the product uh, and also packages pricing and the promotional uh, concepts so in all the aspects marketing aspects uh, the uh, beti bachao and beti padhao program has uh, uh, has uh, made use of all these concepts in popularizing um, this uh, uh, campaign so in that respect if uh, it is made very you can say impressive effective then this campaign will be more effective than the earlier so uh, thanks to deepa who has uh, this uh, applied this uh, market strategy market concept social market concept to the uh, beti bachao and beti padhao program and uh, coming to the last paper presentation sneha patil sneha patil Uh, who has uh, 
enlightened us on gender inequality in village panchayat in adhara village uh, as she has mentioned so in uh, uh 92 1992 1992 this uh, amendment to the constitution uh, has given you can say 73rd amendment has done and 33% of uh, seats were reserved for women and uh, later in 2099 even the 50% of reservation was made in the uh, panchayat raj institutions at the grassroots level uh, but of course as she has mentioned from her study Uh, conducted at adara village in maharashtra maharashtra uh, uh, she uh, uh, came to uh, uh, she she presented that uh, even though women are given 50% of reservation to the uh, in the local uh, uh, gram panchayat uh, bodies but uh, there are many problems for their actual or active participation real participation in panchayat raj activities but of course this is not only true in maharashtra but this is true everywhere in all the states in uh, states in india of course even in karnataka also we have conducted a study about uh, the women's participation in panchayat raj institutions so we found the same uh, you can say same um, findings we come out with the same findings where you can say women are uh, women are uh, not directly not you can say Uh, not actively participating in the uh, in the uh, panchayat raj uh, you can say uh, in the gram panchayats or taking you can say decisions when it comes to the taking decisions important decisions uh, they are not you can say the decisions are not uh, are not considered so uh, that is why you can say uh, though uh, the, the, they are the members but the actual you can say members who are exercising real power are from the behind the screen you can say behind the screen it is the men or it is the husband of the husband um, in the husband of the member uh, panchayat member or it is the male members in the family or the uh, male members of the panchayat or the brothers of the uh, member elected so they were the real uh, real participants real you can say decision makers uh, in the uh, uh, in the panchayats so that is what you can say we have seen not only in maharashtra but in all the you can say states of india so this is the very you can say critical situation as far as women status is concerned so though you can say we have uh, women uh, you can say women uh, uh, participation is increased as far as voting is concerned voting is concerned but uh, their participation their actual participation when it comes to the uh, taking decisions it has been not uh, satisfactory so the same you can say uh, uh, findings have been presented by sneha patil in her paper and uh, she has also i agreed with her about the problems which you can say which act as a restraint for the active political participation of women at the grassroots level so it is because of her illiteracy because of the illiteracy ignorance or burdened with household work lack of communication skills poverty in different attitudes of officials and bureaucratic you can say constraints uh, so all those you can say that come in the way of their actual you can say participation so so uh, that is why uh, though you can say we can ask now a question so uh, now a question uh, in this connection that uh, how far uh, the political you can say political uh, reservation has helped women to empower themselves to empower themselves is it you can say is it a reality so what is the reality then so what are the constraints so how we have to overcome so these are the questions now uh, to ask uh, for the uh, academics to uh, to suggest some suggest some for policy implications because this is a matter of uh, uh, policy and we need you can say better uh, outcome uh, from this uh, uh, conference uh, Uh, conference to increase the awareness and active participation and empowerment of women especially the marginalized groups uh, 
so this is uh, what i would like to this uh, share with you and i congratulate all the paper presenters for making a very nice very fruitful presentation on uh, different facets of gender and the technological uh, relationship uh, i thank all of them and uh, um, i thank at the bottom of my heart the organizers for giving me this opportunity to chair this session i especially thank uh, dr desai who um, has given this opportunity who was in touch with me and uh, given this opportunity for me to chair this session so thank you uh, thank you one and all thank you supriya supriya thank you so much professor shakuntala ma'am for sharing your insightful opinions and thoughts on the papers that was truly great and relevant and all the participants as well for your paper presentations i now invite ms sheba antho chalutra first year ba communicative english student sd college to propose the vote of thanks good afternoon everyone it is my great pleasure to propose the vote of thanks for the technical session 7 of the two day virtual international conference on gender studies post 1990s technological encounters and narratives of empowerment jointly organized by the post graduate department of english sc college alapura and bt bazao of kyan department of students development shivaji university kolapur maharashtra first of all i express our sincere gratitude to professor shagundala shetter professor department of sociology and director research center for women studies karnataka university dhawar who chaired the session and with her insightful opinion made the session a pleasant one i would also like i would also like to express our deep sense of gratitude to the most important contributors of the session ms smita ek ms asha ms dr deepa engavali ms suman pandurang gestane patil for the enlightening presentation my thanks ms shivapriya jayaprakash third year ba english literature student sc college the moderator of this session i must mention my sincere gratitude to all the student organizers faculty and staff the pg department of english sc college alapura and the beti bazao of kyan department of student development shivaji university kolapur maharashtra for the outstanding efforts which made the session a successful one I thank all the participants who participated in the discussion and made it a fruitful one. Lastly, I extend my hearty thanks to each and every one who attended the session and contributed with success. Thank you all. Thank you, Ms. Sheba. With that, thank we have come to the end of the session. We are breaking for lunch now. Hope to meet you all in the next plenary session, which is due to begin by 1:30 p.m. in the afternoon, where we will have Dr. Swapna Gopinath. Associate Professor of Film and Cultural Studies, Symbiosis Institute of Media and Communication, Pune, speaking on the topic, Brand Feminism, Reading Contemporary Visual Cultural Practices. Have a great lunch and join us by 1.30 p.m. using the Google Meet link provided in our Telegram group. Once again, I thank you all for being part of such a lively intellectual experience. Thank you. Thank you Shakuntala ma'am. Uh thank you very much madam. So Reena madam we would like to call you uh, to Dharwad. <laughs> <laughs> yes yes ma'am please please do. <laughs> yeah. Okay thank you so much. We will yeah. keep in touch. Yeah yeah sure. Sure. Okay, okay. thank you. Thank you ma'am. Thank you.
हेलो कार्तिका हेलो मैम 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 हाय 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 I think Lena hasn't joined. Lena, Pai. Ah, uh, Lena, ma'am, hasn't joined. It's Lena or Billai who joined. Yeah, I know. Wait till Lena joins. Kartika Lena has joined. Ah uh, yes, ma'am. Lena, ma'am has joined. Hello. Yeah, Lena. Hi, ma'am. We're yes. waiting for you. Shall we begin, Lena, ma'am? Yeah, yeah. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah, yes, we can. Lena, ma'am. Yes. Shall we begin, ma'am? Hello, Sapna, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. I'm good. I'm good to go. Yeah. Ma'am, shall we begin? Yes, yes. Uh, from my yes, side, yes. I'm good. Yeah. yeah begin, yes, Lina. we may we may begin. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lena Arpile, welcoming you to the fourth plenary session of the two-day virtual international conference on gender studies post 1990s technological encounters and narratives of empowerment. Organized by the Postgraduate Department of English, Sanadana Dharma College, Alapuja, in collaboration with the Betty Bichavo Abhiyan, Department of Students Development, Shivaji University, Kolhapur, Maharashtra. Today, we have a very distinguished guest, Dr. Sopna Gopinath, Associate Professor of Film and Cultural Studies, Symbiosis Institute of Media and Communication, Pune. She will be engaging us with her invaluable ideas on brand feminism, reading contemporary visual cultural practices. I request all participants to switch off their microphones and camera to ensure better quality. Now, I would like to invite Ms. Devi S., Assistant Professor of English, SD College, Alapuja, for the welcome speech. Over to you, Devi, ma'am. Uh, thank you, uh, Lena Pillai. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. 
yeah thank you a very good afternoon to all the virtual international conference on gender studies post 1990s organized jointly by the postgraduate department of english st college alapura and the department of students uh, development shivaji university kolapur has uh, successfully entered into its second day today uh, being the fourth uh, plenary session we've had a uh, very eminent speakers in all the previous sessions and uh, the current session is no different a speaker dr swapna gopnath has etched out a very prominent and impressive space in the sphere of gender studies especially feminism i have the pleasure of uh, introducing dr swapna dr swapna gopnath is an associate professor of film and cultural studies at uh, symbiosis institute of media and communication pune she is a fulbright uh, fellow at the university of rochester new york and a post uh, former post doc fellow at school for media and cultural studies uh, tata institute of social sciences mumbai she is a ugc research awardee and writes about film gender and cultural practices today dr swapna will be uh, speaking to us on brand feminism reading contemporary contemporary visual cultural practices on behalf of uh, the department of english of st college and department of students uh, development shivaji university kolhapur and on my own personal behalf i extend a very warm welcome to you ma'am thank you so much thank you devi uh, uh, yeah, thank and you. Um, thank you for all the kind words <laughs> so yeah mm. so i yeah <laughs> okay so um um it's an honor and a privilege to be here um, on this platform uh, and um, i would like to thank um, kartika uh, leena ma'am and all the organizers of both sd college and uh, Uh, Shivaji University. Uh, it's it's been a pleasure listening to many of the um, sessions. I have been uh, off and on uh, uh, coming to listen and uh, to uh, understand the kind of um, um, webinar this is turning out to be. You know the kind of discussions that are uh, being shaped in these uh, different sessions, and uh, uh, it is. I find it. I, I I really find it very interesting that this. uh session will be very different i would say from uh, the other sessions because uh, uh most of the sessions earlier uh, looked at um, other aspects of uh, women empowerment and uh, you know uh, different aspects of women empowerment while uh, my my session you know is uh, looks at uh, women's issues gender issues from a very different perspective so uh, the basic premise from where this paper comes from is that uh, we all understand uh, the nature of culture industry we all understand how culture has become increasingly commoditized how our cultural representations our cultural tropes are all commoditized and how we live our life in such a way that we we shape our identities our subjectivities according to the uh, requirements of a market of a commodified uh, you know uh, cultural environment so the whole paper actually comes from there so uh, i felt that i should uh, make this brief introduction before i actually begin my presentation uh, so i will now i think um, start my presentation and then uh, speak hello um um yeah so is my um, screen visible yes ma'am yes ma'am 
Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so this is the uh, title that I have given. Uh, so, uh, I do wish to explain the context um, a little bit before I start my presentation because um, uh, I think it's a very simple thing that I have mentioned here because um, most of us are familiar with this concept of brand feminism. So we understand how feminism is being treated as a brand, how it is being branded by uh, you know our. Uh, uh, market, especially advertisements and various forms of uh, uh, cultural practices. So you you understand that feminism has become a brand. So it is also being treated as a brand. So it is a cultural product. Feminism has become a cultural product. It is being the practice of uh, you know treating feminism as a cultural product uh, is something that you would easily identify as cultural uh, visual cultural practices. So. Um, why is it problematic then? So uh, I would I wish to treat it as a problem. I wish to treat it as a very disturbing trend because um, because of several reasons. So I will just briefly talk about those reasons and then I will begin my presentation. So why is it problematic? Why is it a dangerous trend to consider feminism as a brand? For one, uh, feminism uh, is a value, is a norm, is a practice which ought to be uh, considered as something which is very personal and at the same time very social and cultural and has to uh, be considered in that way as well. So what happens when feminism uh, is treated as a brand? So we understand that or what is the context? text in which feminism gets treated as a brand and uh, so we need to understand that we live in a neoliberal uh, society uh, we live in a world where everything is commodified every normative system is commodified every uh, every social norm is commodified and in such a uh, such a context uh, in a neoliberal context uh, feminism becomes um, constantly uh, it is being shaped to suit the larger structures of uh, neoliberalism the new the normative systems are transformed constantly uh, to cer suit certain uh, value systems which will help uh, in uh, in the neoliberal uh, hegemony of uh, that's that we see around us so it wants people to be highly individualistic so what is neoliberal system it it wants people to uh, forego uh, you know uh, collectives and communities and rather create individualistic highly individualistic uh, kind of uh, systems so here collectives are marginalized so when you talk about feminism feminism has always been about being a collective if you look at the first wave or the second wave or third wave feminism we have seen how uh, being a collective coming together and sharing your uh, you know concerns and working for it uh, has always been the way in which feminism has evolved as a very strong power everywhere in the world so when it becomes individualistic when 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 neoliberal the market economy of neoliberal systems want the individual to remain as individual rather than as a collective uh, that itself is a, a big problem now i would not say that brand feminism has not always done good for uh, the people so uh, one aspect that I would like to speak about is street art, various forms of street art, which is a very interesting popular cultural representation. Uh, and you will see how street art has emerged as an act of resistance as far as women are concerned. So women artists, now I'm sharing uh, these pictures, which you would see in uh, Bombay. And uh, these are pictures, uh, these are created by women artists. Um, Fearless Collective is uh, uh, actually a woman, uh, Shailo Suleiman, who does these. The, the other one is, again, a very famous, uh, the Pink Lady by Jas Chiranjeeva. These are two women who have created these uh, uh, street art um, pictures. Uh, so the, both of them, have. these are very um, strong, powerful statements uh, against patriarchy. Then there are also these uh, pictures which are again from uh, Jas and GB and there's also another person called Anpu Varki. These are all women street artists who have been doing such excellent work. Uh, and uh, these are pictures which uh, are, which you will find uh, on the streets of Bombay and uh, where uh, it is it is such a popular art form. Uh, though these art forms do have their own problems, but as uh, an art of uh, as an act of resistance, as a, a feminist uh, representation, uh, these pictures, these images become very, very powerful and very influential. 
So women do get to express their identity. Women do get to talk about how uh, visual representation. Now, these pictures are very much about a Bollywood uh, representation of women and uh, the problems that are there and, you know, how they have subversed uh, these, um, you know, uh, subverted these uh, images uh, to create a kind of empowerment for women. Now, coming to uh, what I've been talking about, I will uh, deal with post-feminist discourses as well as neoliberal feminism. So post-feminist discourse is something which uh, you would uh, probably see along with the third wave of feminism. Uh, while the third wave of feminism dealt with all the major aspects like intersectionality, multivocality, and identity politics, uh, and it also even uh, led to a lot of uh, challenging of stereotypes. So you had some interesting work Work, uh, you know, like people like Eve uh, Ensler's uh, vagina monologues and all of those, uh, all of those works like Susan Fallow, a lot of uh, interesting feminist uh, feminist uh, representations you could find during this time. But along with that, you also see the growth of something like uh, a post-feminist discourse. So I have used uh, the ideas of Angelo Mac probably in this uh, for this particular presentation to talk about post feminist phenomena so what exactly is this post feminist discourse uh, it is a very interesting um, phenomena which which questions or challenges uh, the fact that there is a feminism and do we really need a feminism any longer? So uh, Judith Butler uses the term double entanglement. I've, I've used it in my pre presentation too, but she talks about how this uh, uh, the modern postmodern woman is caught between this um, two positions of being neoconservative and being liberal. And from this point, uh, she believes that uh, there is no need of a feminism right now because we have uh, achieved what we wanted to achieve. And uh, what we wanted to achieve was basically freedom and choice. So you will see, you know, these are the ideas that I will be talking about as we look at uh, various cultural practices, various uh, films, and I've, I've used a few films to talk about this. So there is this notion of freedom and the, free and the freedom to choose. So feminism has been especially post-feminist discourses, work around this concept that feminism has achieved its goals and that women have gained this freedom to choose. Now, this is a very difficult situation for women to be in because they are caught between these two notions of being neoconservative and being liberal at the same time. And these are women who have been taught to be individualistic. So they do, they are not required to, uh, to be in a collective, to, to form communities as women uh, to encourage homosocial bonding, but rather to be individual and uh, to monitor themselves, you know, to constantly look at themselves and to see how empowered they are because they have the freedom to choose. Now, what is this choice that they are making? How informed are their choices? Now, this is where the problem lies. And it also uh, is, is something which totally negates the presence of all the others. This is again a big issue because you are looking only at the middle class, uh, you know, urban woman here. And uh, this is what I will be talking about when we look at the advertisements as well. What about all those other women that we have, especially in the context of India? There are so many other uh, communities. There are so many other uh, caste identities, you know, the intersectionalities that we constantly try to uh, to forget uh, and to uh, erase uh, from this whole picture. So post-feminism takes away a lot of those, um, uh, you know, a lot of those major issues from the platform form and tries to uh, reduce it uh, to the level where a woman is an individual who has the freedom to choose. Now, this is a very, very minimalist kind of understanding of feminism. Now, uh, but this is exactly what, uh, what the neoliberal feminist discourses would like you to believe in and to think about. So, so while we have people like Rebecca Walker and others who there are lots of these women who are, who are looking at the third wave and the fourth wave and trying to address these issues where feminism becomes the commodity. At the same time, we also have uh, people who talk about neoliberal, uh, who, are, who uh, uh, advocate neoliberal feminism. 
so, uh, so w- what happens with neoliberal feminism is that it acknowledges gender inequality, uh, but refuses to acknowledge the influence of socio-political and cultural structures that creates this kind of gender inequality. They do not want those issues to be addressed. So it is, as, as I said earlier, it is very exclusionary in nature and fails to identify all those intersectional, the intersectional nature of feminism, all the marginalized categories or the uh, all those all those people who all those women who belong to other communities other than the uh, the hegemonic community and uh, it is it is it has its own it is very easy to uh, to have a, a new conservative agenda and uh, uh, it is it is easy to set those uh, neo conservative agendas into practice uh, so neoliberal feminism would not take into consideration so it would take into consideration the concept of freedom and choice but it would not take into consideration the question of agency which is a very interesting very significant aspect in this context so um, as I was telling you earlier, instead of political critiquing and collective struggle, you have something very different. You have an individual, you have an individual woman who who believes that she is stronger because she has the freedom of choice. But whereas it has taken away a lot of the strength that feminism originally had as a collective, as, um, as a group of women talking for themselves and trying to understand the nature of their agency. So now we have a feminism which talks about the psychologies of positivity and confidence and entrepreneurial skills uh, and it would tell you to uh, talk to think about the spirit to transform the self you know so you have self help books uh, which would help you to uh, change your uh, self you know to to make yourself more powerful and confident so katherine rottenberg has written about this aspect on uh, neoliberal feminism she speaks about this emphasis on the work family balance and uh, and uh, this is something which we see and as we talk about um, as we look at uh, different um, visual cultural um, examples from visual culture uh, we will uh, probably be telling about this more so it is always it is trying to produce and legitimize the exploitation of the other so it becomes a, a complicit uh, you know partner rather than uh, um, a critical uh, presence of uh, capitalism so you would you would rather be okay you are okay with capitalism and all other forms of social injustice and uh, this is exactly what neoliberalism uh, what neoliberal structures want feminism to evolve itself into and you will see that this is happening in the uh, context of india as well as globalization and neoliberal has reached India as well. So we, we see the same thing happening in India. So we have uh, feminists like Rosamund Gill and Sarah Ferris talking about this, you know, critiquing this kind of neoliberal feminist discourses. So let's now uh, start looking at uh, films and understand how brand feminism is being sold so beautifully. Um, and uh, I think uh, I would like to mention 22 Female Kodem as probably the first film in uh, in Malayalam that uh, that truly used brand feminism and it did not just have advertisements but it started by using uh, the strength of social Social media. So it was one of probably the first films that used social media to such a great extent. It was talking about feminism. It was talking about women empowerment. And at the point, people were very happy to believe that this is a feminist film. So what is wrong with this film? You probably, if you are uh, someone who is into feminist uh, cinema, would uh, definitely know that this film is very, very problematic. The films, the idea of feminism that is uh, perpetuated by this film is a, is a very real problem because uh, the film looks at uh, rape the film looks at rape as uh, uh, as something which should be revenged by cutting off a man's sexual organ. Cutting off the penis is not the answer for uh, a violent act like rape. So the film endorses such a behavior. And at the same time, uh, at the end of the film, if you if you you remember the film uh, at the end of the film it is not a, a, a man who is beaten and you know uh, sort of completely defeated that you see uh, the uh, the fahad fasil walks away quite triumphantly 
if you watch the film again you would you would notice that element of triumph that you see he has not he he, he has not really lost anything it's not a moral victory as far as the woman is concerned so the film used feminism as a very interestingly uh, you know saleable uh, brand and um, whereas the film did not really have that kind of a, or did not endorse that kind of a feminism coming to a film like varathan uh, i would say it is it is again a film that uh, uses the brand of feminism uh, and it definitely has uh, you know traveled a long way from where we were with 22 female cotte definitely now i have used these two films because these are two mainstream films uh, which used the brand of feminism now varathan the title itself is uh, masculine gender right uh, it uses the masculine gender and when it comes to taking revenge uh, it is the man or it is the master of the house who actually takes charge of the situation so although it is a woman who kills again again the whole notion of rape uh, rape as an act uh, which has to be uh, revenge which has to, which you have to take revenge for on a very personal level is something which this film uh, endorses as well and and it is the film ends with the man sitting there you know ready to uh, destroy any kind of intruder destroy any kind of any any sense of uh, you know um, um, anyone including a cockroach i think it was a cockroach that was shown that he he brutally kills so any kind of intrusion is not welcome and it is by the master of the house it is the man who is the varathan who is who's the outsider who 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 would destroy any any power that will uh, you know uh, attack his family and his private space so these two films uh, use this notion of feminism uh, very beautifully but at the same time refuses to uh, really address the issues of feminism coming to um, uh, hindi films of course pink is definitely a film that uh, you would uh, remember as a feminist film and it was also uh, in you know uh, um, sold as a as a feminist film the very use of the word pink for example is something which tells us about uh, that this is about women but look at this uh, this you know this poster of this film and you see that it is the man who who takes up half the space in this poster so it is also if you have seen the film again it sells itself as a as a uh, it's a it's a feminist film it uses the brand of feminism but at the same time it requires a man although he is an old man he is also uh, mentioned to be uh, mentally ill often he is senile and uh, he is very different from the rest he's he's sort of alienated from the rest of the society and he is the one who comes forth to to help these three women so the women needs requires the help of a man although he is old and senile and you would remember how this film was uh, branded as a feminist film because uh, amida bachchan even wrote a letter to his uh, daughter i think on international women's day or something in in relation to this film so it is it is a film that is totally you know completely sold as a as a feminist film whereas it does has it has its own problems uh, okay uh, then comes um so you need uh, uh, you need some kind of a help from the women from, from the man now coming to a film like biredi wedding uh, it was again a film that uh, was hailed as being a film about um, you know homosocial bonding so you would see a lot of films uh, about men you know male homosocial bonding about the strength about uh, the kind of fun that they have and about the camaraderie that you would see uh, now you do, you would you would think that this film is something similar but it is not uh because the film has its own problems it it is all it is all about marriages it is all about uh women uh coming from really rich uh, families and uh, very privileged kind of women so it 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 uh, defeats the notion of homosocial bonding and female empowerment then coming to thappad i'm sure it's a film which was again sold as a as a feminist film using uh, the brand that we understand we know as feminism now the problem with this film is sev- i mean i would say there are several problems with this film uh, one is that of course um, the 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 thappad that we talk about 
often happens within domestic spaces. Abuse, physical abuse, mental abuse, emotional abuse within a family is often something that happens within the domestic spaces, the intimate spaces. It does not, uh, uh, you know, the film actually talks about this thabbat that happens in front of everyone. So that itself uh, sort of, uh, you know, um, makes it difficult uh, in, in a certain way. Then the second problem is that there is there is a lot of violence in uh, the maid's family. The film is about the middle class, the upper middle class families, uh, middle class women, and it sort of uh, uh, demonizes uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the lower class. Uh, it does not mean, if you look at the actual actualities, you would see that the kind of physical violence that you see in upper class or uh, middle class is also very high, although many of them, most of them are not reported. But it, it, the film, the film sort of demonizes the lower class and uh, the kind of violence that you see in that lower class uh, family is uh, exaggerated to a high level. So the, a problem that I mentioned earlier about neoliberal feminism is something that you would see here as well. So the marginalized are marginalized further and demonized as well as uh, in, in this particular film. Uh, though I have not put the slide here, but uh, there's another film that I would like to mention in this context, which is Shakuntala, uh, a film that got released. It's a film that should have used the, all the potential because it was about this woman. Uh, a mathematic genius who was so powerful as uh, as a, a woman in the field of uh, mathematics and having this extraordinary skill but the film reduced it to such a level that the the film is all about this mother and daughter it is about the relationship between the mother and daughter between shakuntala and her daughter so it was quite disappointing to watch the film how it was branded as a feminist film but it came out to be all about this relationship where a woman is reduced to being a mother you know rather than a woman now coming to femvertising, which is again a very popular term, I'm sure you might have heard about it. People from mass communication will be very familiar with the word femvertising. So it is it is about where you're selling the concept of feminism, as I mentioned earlier, grand feminism. Uh, so femvertising uses feminism as a cultural commodity and uh, selectively, this is where the problem lies, it selectively uses, um, I hope I'm not taking more time than is given to me. Um, Please do stop me, Kartika, if I exceed my time limit. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, so as I was telling you, so feminism becomes a cultural commodity. So, uh, it is select. It selectively uses certain uh, feminist tropes for perpetuating a certain kind of uh, identity, which is socially accepted as feminism, while the real issues and foundations of patriarchal structures remain intact. Nobody wants to question them. Nobody wants to change them. Um, so it remains intact. Now, the problems that lie in this context is what is mentioned here. Most of the companies that uh, do femortizing do not really address these issues that are mentioned in this, uh, in this um, you know, slide. So they don't employ a lot of women. They don't do all those things that are required. And uh, uh, globally, these things have come out. And um, you know, several companies have been you know exposed as being very um, not being very friendly to uh, other genders, including women. So. Uh, uh, it becomes more like a lip service. So femitizing is all about selling feminism as a commodity where uh, the real issues are never addressed. So brands, if you look at how brands try to stay clear from the, using a word like feminist, you know, they don't really want to say feminist. Uh, you know, uh, there are so many things that you would see. Uh, how feminism uh, would again try to, femitizing uses this notion of the individual, woman as the individual. And uh, Nancy Fraser uh, says that it is, it is not about meritocratic equality that we should be talking about. So feminism is about abolishing sexual hierarchy of all kinds. It is not about meritocratic equality. It is not about women as individuals trying to you know become successful in life or you know using certain products and becoming better that is not how it is so the very notion of feminism is being distorted by femitizing 
so uh, a feminist uh, so even if you look at how uh, certain products are sold again you know you will see this especially like high value products it's usually men who make the decisions and not women now i have used uh, dove um, as one of the advertisements here because uh, dove talks a lot about it uses a lot of feminizing you know it is it's constantly using this notion of feminism but at the same time it is the same company that sells axe as well axe perfume has been under a lot of uh, you know criticism for their very very misogynist advertisements so um, so you have to remember it's a company that is so um, you know hypocritical because it just uses feminism as a as a commodity uh, then comes this ariel's advertisement of share the load which is a very very um, you know popular advertisement which again uh, looks at sharing the load where the laundry is considered to be a woman's job and a man is only sharing it so woman's job within the household the homemaker or this one amul uh, home is where the heart is where you have the woman doing uh, you know cooking and uh, it's a super woman that we are talking about so uh, so uh, they though, though we're not uh, the patriarchal roles that we have seen is constantly being uh, used here exploited here now coming to neoliberal uh, feminism neoliberal feminism al also has a very um, interesting aspect to it because neoliberal neoliberalism which uses uh, feminism as a brand also is uh, you know also creates a kind of environment for governments and for uh, you know pol political parties and you know social uh, other kinds of um, social um, uh, socially powerful bodies to use feminism as another uh, as a brand so branding is a process that is becoming increasingly used by political parties as well as by governments so th this new brand of feminism that we see in india for example uh, so um, you might have seen especially in kerala you would have seen how this notion of kulastri came up in the uh, context of uh, the shabrimala um, issue where you had a particular kind of a woman the body of a woman was politicized in that context and um, uh, if you look at the indian context you will see this new form of neoliberal feminism which is very strongly rooted in the notion of a nationhood so it is a kind of a tribal nationalism ethnic nationalism or a cultural nationalism that you see which tries to focus or tries to focus on a kind of a, a, a woman kind of womanhood what kind of a womanhood do you see there it is a woman who is very strongly rooted in the family it is a woman who would uh, accept all kind of paternal uh, authority it is a woman who would remain within the family so uh, that's why i have a problem with the use of a word like beti bachao beti padhao so i'm sorry i'm saying this but the use of the word beti instead of a, a girl child or a, a girl or a woman now now reducing a woman to the level of a member within the family when you say think of her as your bro, as your sister it's it's again something very insulting to a woman because a woman is a woman a girl is a girl girl not just a, a daughter or not just a sister or not just a wife or a mother so this kind of a nationalism this kind of a notion of a nationhood uh, also believes that woman is a is a is a member of a family or her, she her identity is not as an independent entity but as a family member as part of a family relationship so here this is a woman who is being born and brought up into such a family which is very very you know sort of exclusionary it creates a kind of homogeneous entity of feminism which uh, does not want to think about other aspects of uh, you know a womanhood other kinds of other uh, cultures of uh, where womenhood exist so in this notion uh, in this context there is um, uh, there is something called uh, sarah faris has talked about it and uh, she calls it femo nationalism this is again a, a new kind of uh, nationalism or uh, a notion of uh, a, a womanhood so she says uh, usually right wing parties and uh, new liberals push this kind of a 
politics through women's rights uh, agenda and she takes the example of islam so she talks about how islam is being framed as a misogynistic religion and culture so this is this is something that sarah faris calls femo nationalism she calls such people who endorses this kind of a feminism as femocrats so such people uh, celebrate traditional gender roles and calls their calls it as women empowerment so this becomes a strong counter cultural um, force you know uh, against uh, all the kind of developments that feminism have been trying to uh, get so this is again one form of um, you know uh, i'll be coming to this later uh, where uh, this is a form of um, uh, uh, womanhood that is being uh, endorsed so i'm using the example of durga vahini which is a form of a uh women's group uh, which is supposed to uh, empower women so what kind of empowerment does it happen what what happens in this context uh, that that's the problem that i'm trying to highlight so here a, a sort of a feminism a brand feminism is being uh, sold here uh, and uh, what is it that it tries to focus upon for one it focuses upon physical prowess physical strength so this sort of a feminism uh, it but focuses on physical strength it is about disciplining the mind and body it is about trying to build an identity as a daughter as a mother as a as i said earlier it is about understanding and accepting the paternal uh, authority that is around you and uh, and being okay with it and it is the most important uh, you know critique that should be against this form of a uh, 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 brand uh, of feminism would be that it is exclusionary it does not permit we have been talking about intersectionality of uh, feminism we have moved so much uh, as far as feminism is concerned and you know understanding identities and you know those problems but here we take a step back you know several steps back because it become it is so exclusionary it does not uh, it does it, it is built upon a kind of uh, you know hatred it is built upon, upon a certain kind of um, notion of a nationhood and how, the role of women uh, in that nation which excludes several uh, kinds of womanhood several identities of uh, womanhood and uh, it becomes camouflaged uh, it becomes something like a camouflaged ethnocentrism which is a very very uh, you know um, dangerous prospect when it comes not only to womanhood but also to nationhood so we have these self sacrificing obedient women uh, who are physically strong but have, do not have the will to rise in power against actually oppressive social structures they would uh, they would hit and you know probably um, you know disarm a, a, a an attacker but the larger picture remains the same it it is oppressive and nobody would want to talk about it so this is just i've just used pictures from uh, some of those um, you know camps that are uh, conducted by uh, 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 by durga vahini groups and uh, you can uh, it's actually one of those pictures is from kannur from kerala so uh, so this kind of uh, a new form of Uh, uh feminism is being uh, sold over the counter actually because it's it's like uh, it's 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 definitely a commodity that is being sold and uh, as a brand feminism has has been evolving especially in the indian context from not just as a as a commodity that is sold on television on on press it is also something that is sold uh, across cultures it is sold uh, in the societies as a as a as a kind of living as a certain form of uh, living that should be uh, imitated by women so uh, i think um, i will conclude here uh, saying that um, Uh, this is just a presentation and uh, and uh, i'm just trying to open a, a, a kind of discussion on to this aspect of um, you know um feminism that uh, is very relevant in contemporary indian society yeah that's it thank you sapna ma'am that was a really enlightening session now it's a time for discussion participants can ask questions you can either post the questions in the chat box or ask directly after unmuting your microphones
Hello, Swapna, ma'am. Hi. I would like to. I would like to ask you a question. Sure. Uh, you Please. spoke about the commodification of feminism. Um, because it, there is this commodification, along with a uh, fact that feminism is being uh, pushed. Uh, actually, it is a farce. I should. I would say it is a farce to the extent. that uh, even though women are said to be liberated the strings are always controlled by some patriarchal power which is behind them they are they are allowed to move but only with the tethers strongly tied elsewhere we have a lot of girl students in our college and they have the liberty to use the mobile phones especially in this time of the pandemic most of the students are all i should say all of the students do use mobile phones but there is a um, actually they are subjected to surveillance from their family and from the society and from their uh, uh, brothers or fathers or whoever so there is this thing and i am also reminded of one particular incident which happened in kerala not one incident one movement uh, in feminism uh, you might also have uh, seen it uh, a particular ratri uh, nadattam because uh, at that time many several social activists uh, wanted to establish the fact that women uh, should be allowed to move at whatever time they wanted to move outside their homes even during night in the night and there was this ratri nadattam then a group of women walked across the streets of course the so called enlightened and the so called uh, uh, activists i should say but of course the police knew that these women were walking and uh, many it was given high uh, publicity and naturally nobody would dare to attack them so i should, i think there such a lot of fuss is going around in the name of feminism that uh, we uh, need to empower our young girls about what is true and what is false and what exactly they need and how they should work towards coming out of these patriarchal uh, structures or bondages which pull them down that's what i think what is your opinion about this uh thank you lena ma'am for that uh, interesting observation uh, uh in fact uh, i'll i'll respond to the second part of your question first because um, it's something which is very um, very close to my heart as well uh, so um uh, it was in kerala this ratri nadattam you know like walking um, at night you know in the evening after sunset uh, women walking on the roads reclaiming uh, you know spaces which is a very a significant thing which is a very empowering act but in kerala what happened was that it was not conducted in an organic manner it was just all of a sudden you had one one or two instances and that was it but in bombay uh um the where i was doing my postdoc um uh, the center for media and culture studies uh, department has a faculty a member shilpa ke and uh, shilpa along with three of her friends has written a book called why loiter okay uh you can buy the book also if you are interested it is why loiter this book is all about this movement called why loiter movement so why loiter movement was about women reclaiming public spaces so they conduct a lot of programs of similar kind okay so they they do these kind of women walking uh, together on the streets uh, at night and you know women going so you are asked to if you can volunteer to be one of those women to go and sleep in a public park for example you have to just carry your blanket and your pillow along with you so why loiter movement has successfully done this uh, of reclaiming public spaces so this is a very significant act of empowerment if it's done properly and i have seen it happen in bombay so you 
because women do need to reclaim that spa those spaces, pu uh, public spaces are something which women have to reclaim and it is an act of empowerment, no doubt about it. But the way in which it is conducted and if it is, if, uh, it, it is something that has to be regularly done, it is not something that is to be done one day and then that's it. That, that is again treating feminism as a brand rather than actually doing an, an act of empowerment but while out a movement has been doing it for quite quite a long time right now and i have i've been i've participated in it and i know how it works now coming to the first part of your question of course uh, patriarchy is a very very powerful structure and neoliberal uh, world this world right now that we are living in is a neoliberal system which is so uh, conducive to patriarchy you know it is it, it is so conducive to patriarchy and the kind of feminism that we are told uh, that this is feminism is actually also problematic because it takes only certain elements of, uh, you know, elements. That is what I was talking about in my session, because it picks certain aspects of feminism and uh, uh, sells it as feminism. Whereas the real issues of actually addressing these uh, bigger issues of uh, patriarchal uh, exploitation, misogyny is not really addressed at all. Even when you talk about something like rape, uh, as I was mentioning in 22FK, uh, so um, even something like rape is addressed in a very, very, um, sub, uh, you know, you would call it a very regressive manner. The notion of rape itself is, so how do you look at it from a feminist perspective? How do you look at it? So these are things which are not really dealt with. It is at the level of, you know, feminism is mostly dealt at the level of an effective kind of a, a thing rather than a, actually address issues as you said so uh, and surveillance with all those new means of surveillance we have already been self-surveying ourselves you know women have been doing that so before you come out of the house you do a uh, you look in the mirror a hundred times uh, to see you know you look at yourself from the eyes of a man to see how it is how you look you're not looking at from your own perspective you're looking at from the perspective of a society which is mostly patriarchal which is male centered so you're looking with a male gaze and seeing if your body looks fine so the self surveillance you have already been doing you've been conditioned to do and now that we have mobile phones and other devices which is all very strong means of monitoring and surveillance we see that uh, you know this is encouraged in the name of fear and insecurity you know you you talk about uh, you know protecting somebody but you're actually creating a lot of uh, you know cages around that person right so i think it's it's a more uh, it's an issue that needs to be dealt with with a more stronger and you know sense of awareness that this is about an individual this is about a human being that we're talking about yeah yeah, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. That was a very, very wonderful way of uh, explaining it. Thank you so much. Yeah, if you're interested, please do buy Weiloiter, the book. It's it's a very interesting text by Shilpa Fatke. Yeah. Okay, ma'am. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Are there any more questions? Yes, I would like to say something to Dr. Swapna. Sure, please do, Bindu. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Bindu from ST College. Yeah, I can see uh, your name. You know, yeah, we were, uh, I, I agree completely with what you said. And in Kerala, I'll just uh, share a little bit of my personal experience, that's all. Yes, of, please. Uh, being a feminist, but, um, well, <laughs> you know, because we have different uh, brands of feminism in Kerala now. Mm -hmm. And the most famous, uh, or rather the, uh, the derogatory word that is used for feminist is feminity. Hmm. Yeah. So which sort of, and they use that to subvert the whole argument of feminism. So yes. what, you know, people like uh, we do, at least what I do is that uh, while staying within, you know, the external parameters of tradition, we try to, I, I practice a kind of, uh, I, me and my friends, we all practice a kind of everyday fe feminism is what, is what I call it, you know, without, because once you're uh, labeled as a feminist, then, then nothing works. Mm. Then you can't practice feminism at all. So what we do is that we do a kind of everyday feminism by talking to our students, by talking to each other 
and doing focusing on the basic aspects and the important aspects of feminism while you know staying away from the uh, the elements of brand feminism as you said mm-hmm. now mm-hmm. is this how you know uh, at least most people take it forward because i have a feeling that in spite of everything feminism is going forward and it the undercurrent is still there i was mm-hmm. just wondering how you know it actually works you know feminism is actually as i was talking about uh, in my presentation it is a it is a it is something which is very strong and powerful right now but the version of feminism that is being endorsed validated right now is the is where the problem lies so yes. is this the kind of feminism that we want is the question so feminism is not going to die or anything because people uh, it's it's a very very um, you know it's got a lot of it's very popular uh so so it as a brand feminism will definitely survive everything but as a brand again the problem is that it is a brand it is a commodity so what kind of feminism do we need is it is it this feminism that we need is it this feminism that is that uh, excludes a lot of categories of people is it a feminism that is only for the privileged the entitled right so feminism is something is about feminisms and yeah. uh, if it does not take that into consideration then it becomes a lost battle yeah right. and it also if, pretends to be feminism as you pointed out yes in, yes in, because in it picks media. and chooses it picks yeah. and chooses certain aspects of feminism which is which will help the neoliberal normative systems to flourish in society yes. Yeah. right and but it is left to people like us to actually yes, pick out yes. the so <laughs> when oh, as you as you said feminisms have always survived in small parts in small you know you know in small communities in different ways so maybe it could be something like a decolonizing practice where uh, you you let a kind of feminism thrive uh, among your people uh like for example now um, if you look at feminisms and colleges for example uh, we know that our colleges have women studies uh, groups right we have women studies centers how do we how do we run them and we have something like icc so uh, internal complaints committee so if you have a girl student uh, facing some kind of harassment from a, a, a student a male student or a teacher or a, so there are there are all of these provisions that are available so are you really using them in your campus so it's yes, just a question always, of the, yeah they are encouraged not to give complaints yeah yeah so okay. there is this notion of let's just settle it you know uh, you will constantly come across that if you if you try to fight that it you, and 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 i've seen how it empowers a girl student when a student is allowed to make that complaint yeah you know uh, so it empowers the student because it it feels that you know a student because we know that we are dealing with young girls and they are at a very vulnerable age which you know this is when you can actually put in thoughts of feminism within their thought within their thought processes and what we constantly do is we tell them to compromise and to you know to give up on those notions of the ideas of empowerment that as teachers we should be doing right yeah hmm. exactly but that's exactly what i was saying that very often these platforms are uh, they remain redundant because they are not allowed no one's allowed to actually use them yes yes so we are left to you know actual uh, everyday feminism in which goes on in the class and inculcating mm. it through mm. you know mm. through our words and through mm. ideas mm. exactly hoping that it will get into the minds at least yes definitely yeah, yeah. thank you ma'am thank you uh, ma'am ma'am there ma'am. are a few questions in the chat box ma'am uh, i'm dr putiwa desai okay, okay. i uh, yes ma'am just uh, one f- uh, film is uh, that is kabir film mm-hmm. it is entirely opposite means uh, how they are portraying is it uh, opposed to the feminism or some pictures those who are showing films all of the films my opinion is that they are portraying the feminism in the context of patriarchy you know? mm-hmm. no uh, kabir was a film which was i did not pick those films which were no, no, critiqued I, I, as uh, no, anti feminist you know kabir uh, i think kabir singh was uh, critiqued as uh, an anti feminist misogynist film so i did not pick those films because they were already being talked about as uh, you know very very misogynist but i just pick those films which were considered to be ah, feminism feminism. feminist and you know films which branded themselves 
themselves as feminist films you know women empowerment films so i picked only those films if you look okay. into bollywood i think uh, you, you there are the hundreds of films is, yeah my question is that these all films those who are shows the feminism but they are to be showing feminism but it is in the that means framework of somewhat where the patriarchy is also reflected there right? no hmm yeah definitely and yeah. uh, that's so i need some more. because you have given very critically whether they are showing or pampering it is the feminism it is the empowerment but uh, just for observation or for things they are to be creating the feminism within that uh, framework of the patriarchism hmm. it uh, is it is this notion of feminism you know what do you understand as feminism is most important you know what what the brands what the advertisements what the films um, you know endorse as feminism is it really what we want as feminism is this what mm-hmm. we are talking about because like nancy fraser uh, was talking about you know this is this is not really this is not what we are talking about this is about we feminism is about abolishing all kinds of sexual uh, gender hierarchies not sexual gender hierarchies so so are we really looking into those aspects you know does mm-hmm. these films or any of these cultural practices actually do that you know but i would say I, i that's why i mentioned street art right in the beginning because i feel that that's that's one aspect of uh, visual culture practice which actually does a lot and if you look at indie cinema for example you know independent cinema of course recently the malayalam cinema that came out was the great indian kitchen right so independent cinema does have those uh, aspects which looks deeper than uh, these uh, very shallow and you know um, um, what do you call very hypocritical kind of notions of feminism yeah okay thank you thank you ma'am there are some questions in the chat box yeah please can you just ah, i'll read out it? okay okay let me see ma'am what is your opinion about female only online networks like women.com how much can an ambitious woman rely on these networks in building her career uh, i don't know about building your career but i can tell you one thing uh, uh, it, yes, homo social that? yes homo social bonding is always very good because men always do that you know male uh, homo social bondings are always very powerful and you know they help one another there is a lot of uh, interaction there's a lot of healthy interaction that happens and i have been part of such uh, groups you know like uh, uh, i i have been part of female uh, groups which i find very very useful it's not uh, i'm not talking about just online networks i'm talking about actual interactions with women and uh, Uh, i am part of such groups which where we enjoy a lot and we help each other a lot and we are emotionally uh, supporting one another we are you know even financially maybe sometimes and uh, also definitely we would help each other in our career as well but i'm not sure about uh, groups like networks like women.com because uh, i don't know how you can use them for building your career you would i would rather say use a general uh, you know networking system to build your career rather than uh, use something like that okay there is one more question ma'am ha huh. uh, do these women empowerment logos and images really symbolize equality uh that's that's what i was trying to say when it comes to commoditizing this notion of feminism uh it is not always oh, uh you know the images that i was um, sharing here and you know uh, i was trying to talk about that that uh, it does not really uh, look at the actual issues that uh, women face it does not really address the issues that feminism is trying to uh, you know deal with so that is where the problem lies so one needs to look beyond those uh, visual representations one need to critique them you know try to see them uh, using the uh, theoretical frameworks that feminists have put forth there are so many of them and it will help them to understand uh, cultural practices in a much better way it will give you deep insights into cultural practices and how misogynous they really are so th- and even the use of language you know like from using use of language you know we know that how uh, feminists have fought bitter battles over how language has to be more gender neutral in most cases yeah yes okay 
are there any more questions okay yeah i have seen power kadavil uh, and the second episode is the one which is about rape right is it the second episode lakshmi jay mohan are you here love panna utranam is the second episode about is that the episode i'm not really very sure are you here lakshmi can you just unmute and answer me or just reply on the message chat ma'am uh, it is yeah. a film in which kalki kalki kochlan is there oh okay it is that film okay okay uh, i know um, uh, i don't uh, that whole um, you know all of those stories actually um, i find them to be very strange actually you know it's uh it it is very powerful no doubt it is very disturbing also especially the last one but it's so melodramatic most of them and the second one has a lot of issues as far as i am concerned i feel the film uh, loses a lot on the aspect of realism uh, and also it is something which um, uh, uses uh, lesbianism it um, you know it's it trivializes i would say that is that is my answer yeah so thank you ma'am yeah that's that's how i see it yeah it trivializes ma'am i have, a question. Mm -hmm. I have a question uh, you pointed out the problematic nature of many films that are branded as feminist films and uh, is there any film that can be identified as representing the ideals of feminism in this post feminist era that's that's what i mentioned you know like if you look at the independent uh, cinema uh, there are films uh, that come out from as indie cinema not as mainstream cinema but as indie cinema and of course the great indian kitchen is one film that i would definitely mention here it's a film that has uh, although it is technically not all that great because it is an indie film which is made with limited budget and everything but it definitely takes a very good uh, position as far as Uh, a woman in Kerala's context is concerned. Yeah. Okay. It wouldn't be discussed so much if it did not have that that sort of a strength in it. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. I think you need to, if you wish to work on feminist cinema, you should definitely look at independent cinema across the world. That is where you see a lot of, uh, you know, like uh, feminist films. Okay, ma'am. Yeah. I think the questions are all over. Okay. And ma'am, is there anything else that you want to communicate? No, no, nothing. Thank you so much for being here all of you. <laughs> and for all the questions and yeah, this interaction. So nice we have come so critical now. Uh, that means interact your critical lecture ma'am. Where all the points that means very that that sigh of first heard your lecture ma thank you so much okay thank you ma'am it was a really wonderful session very interesting and very thought provoking thank, thank you, you so i'm glad you all enjoyed it and is <laughs> more that means uh, the speech uh, speech uh, the slow motion that means very we could get get it easily not uh, well there is the we are speaking no hurriedly speaking but you are taking very smoothly ma'am that i like very much <laughs> thank you thank you so much okay um uh, please now we have come to the end of the interactive session now i invite ms ashudi s assistant professor of english sd college alapuja for the vote of thanks thank you lena good evening everyone so we have just completed our fourth plenary session of uh, today international conference uh, 
So Dr. Sapna Gopinath's brand feminism reading contemporary visual culture practices in that she explained how feminism has evolved as a brand and how it is harmful uh, to consider feminism as a brand and also uh, commodifying this feminism. So Sapna ma'am traveled through the powerful uh, street arts from Mumbai by women artists and women uh, to the uh, film industries uh, where they are using feminism as a, a selling uh, theme and also um, to the advertisement world where they are con considering it as a fem uh, femvertising uh, these uh, advertisement nowadays. So on behalf of SD College, um, English Department and the Department of Students Development, Shivaji University, Kolhapur. I spread my sincere thanks to Dr. Swapna Gopinath for such an informative session. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Ashwati. Thank you. I'm also taking this opportunity to thank my dear friends, uh, Professor Davies, for the introductory remarks and uh, Lena Pipile for the comparing. Thank you. Thank you. Lina ma'am, Bindu ma'am, Pradipa Dejai ma'am and others for those questions too because which all made this session more interesting. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you. So we have come to the end of this session. The participants are requested to fill the feedback forms. The links are provided in the chat box of this session. And this session will be followed by three parallel technical sessions. The 10th technical session will be held in the same platform and the links for the other two sessions uh, has been pro uh, have been provided uh, in the Telegram group as well as in the chat box. The technical session will be followed by a valedictory session at 4 p.m. Now, I'm formally concluding the session. Thank you all for your lively participation. Thank you. The technical session 10 will begin shortly. Uh, the participants are requested to join. Ms. Kasturi, yes, are you there? Okay. 
Yes, ma'am, I'm here. Okay. Miss Shruti yes. S. Miss Shruti. Miss Bhakti Lakshmi Mohan. I'm here. Okay, uh, Miss Namita V S. Miss Namita. Uh, Doctor Renchnia. Yes, I'm here. I'm here. Okay. Miss Shruti Sharma. Anjana ma'am, shall I begin the session? Yeah, sure. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. I am Gina Johnson, second MA English Literature student of SD College, Alapura. And I welcome you all to the technical session 10 of the two-day virtual international conference on gender studies post-1990s, technological encounters and narratives of empowerment organized by the PG Department of English, Sanadana Dharma College, Alapura, in collaboration with Betty Bachavo Abhiyan, Department of Students Development, Shivaji University, Kolapur, Maharashtra. In this session, we will have presentation of various papers on the thrust areas of gender studies that we have received from the faculty, research scholars, and students from across the world 
that is sure to enrich our knowledge. We have with us on the chair, Dr. J. Anchana, Assistant Professor and Head of PG Department of English, NSS College, Pantalam. The five paper presenters of this session are Ms. Kasturi S., Assistant Professor, Department of Humanities and Science, Rajalakshmi Institute of Technology, Chennai. Ms. Sruti S. Kakatil, Research Scholar, Sri Sangaracharya, University of Sanskrit, Kaladi. Ms. Bhagyalakshmi Mohan, Assistant Professor of English, Bharati Darshan Government College for Women, Puducherry. Ms. Namita V.S., Research Scholar, Center for Postgraduate Studies, Research English, St. Joseph College, Devakiri, Calicut. And Dr. Rajini R., Assistant Professor of English, Government Arts College, Taikodo. I request all the participants to kindly turn off their audio and video to ensure better quality. Remember that each presentation will be for five to seven minutes to avoid overstepping the time limit. Also note that there will be an interactive session after the presentation, so all are requested to stay till the end. Your questions can be posted on the comment section, and please don't forget to mention the name of the paper presenter to whom you are asking the question. Once again, I welcome you all to this session. Now I invite the chair of this session, Dr. J. Anjana, to make the introductory remarks and initiate the proceedings. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Gina. Good afternoon, each and everyone present here in this virtual meet. As the whole world is reeling under the onslaught of a raging pandemic, there is no better way for academic interactions than such webinars. I would like to congratulate the organizers, both of them, for coming up with a very pertinent topic in this COVID pandemic era. The last two days of this international webinar had witnessed vibrant theoretical deliberations of various topics related with different aspects of gender. The very term gender is problematic. It implies that behavioral and attitudinal differences brought about by socialization and acculturation. The power dynamics involved in gender relations are linked in complex ways with those of cultural identity and social class. Academic uh, conferences like this helps in a long way to inculcate gender awareness and thereby minimize, minimizing the gender divide. We have uh, come to the last of the technical sessions of this two-day international webinar. And in this session, we have a bunch of excellent papers. First of all, I would like to call upon uh, Kasturi, Ms. Kasturi, yes. She's the Assistant Professor, Department of Humanities and Science, Rajalakshmi Institute of Technology, Chennai. She is, uh, her title the, of the paper is Visualizing the Representation of Gender Confines by Analyzing the Anthropomorphized Elements Present in the Translated Novel of Pedimal Murugan's Punachi or the story of a black goat. Now over to you, Kasturi. Thank you so much, Dr. Anjana Nair Madhu. It's a pleasure to present paper here. And without any further ado, let me directly delve into my paper. Uh, am I audible, ma'am? Hello? Uh, yes, yes, you are. Ah, yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Anthropomorphizing is an ancient art of attributing human characteristics to non-human entities in literary creations, and it always served as an effective tool to enlighten the common readers with regard to the societal implications in a subtle manner, emphasizing its true nature. Nevertheless, it aims to mask the actual persona with a transparent sheet, leaving behind an obvious guess at the end. The history of literature stores a huge pile of anthropomorphizing novels to create a satiric atmosphere in order to address the social issues and to represent the unjust conventional designs framed by the irrational fellow humans. Pirumal Murugan, the renowned Tamil novelist, paints a similar anthropomorphized sketch to his literary piece, Punachi, or the story of a black goat tracing the boundaries of gender implications, unfair societal expectations, and the undeniable emotional trauma, trauma from a deus, which is of go female goat's point of view. 
the controversial aftermath of Morgan's Madhura Bagan, one part woman, forced him to create Punachi to reflect their anxiety of living in a society where the stringent rules are illogically trained, apparently to make life tough to lead. The author himself points out in the preface of Punachi that I'm fearful of writing about humans. Even more, fearful of writing about gods. Yes, let me write about animal. I quote and unquote Murugan. This paper would primarily concentrate on the gender confines structure in the rural setup as it expects every individual to fulfill their gender bound duties, failing which may cause severe repercussions. However, household animals are no way an exception as you're expected to meet their drafted duties to survive as long as they lead a respective life. The novel anthropomorphizes a duo as a woman and pictures the challenges it faced at every step of its life, highlighting the factor of gender roles, gender roles at the possible instance, thereby providing the readers with sufficient knowledge on gender confinements and its cruel realities. Mr. Morgan marks the significance in placing all his novels with the rural smell of Tamar culture, bringing forth the nostalgic memories of rustic pastoral life and the nature of people, portraying them with ease along the arid Congo dialect which is uh, uh, prominently seen in, in the Salem district of Tamil Nadu, setting his novel in the early 20th century, eventually enunciates the stereotypical ideologies of rural people in a way that it neither deteriorates nor builds hybrid smell to their normal life. This makes the readers to move in par with the intrigue, absolutely sensing trueness in the narrator, with a strong feeling of gender conflicts and other uh, superstructural elements, contouring exclusion wow. as uh, is broadened thing. Kalyana Raman, the, the translator of this novel, uh, Punachi, or the story of a black goat, states in the translator's note that Punachi creates a vivid debate. <laughs> As we track the destiny of this orphan goat, shaped by a whole field of humans and animals, uh, is there a uh, I think there has As been some the audio problem, Ms. Kasturi. Uh, okay. uh, from my end, ma'am? I, I don't know from where. Uh, okay, you carry on. Uh, Shamala, yes, ma'am, yes. please mute your mic. Shamala, ma'am. Okay, uh, uh, I think, uh, shall I continue, uh, Ms. Uh, Gina yes, Johnson? Yes, ma'am, yes, ma yes, ma please continue. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, as we track the destiny of this orphan goat, uh, shaped by the force field of uh, humans and animals, we realize that the author's real theme is our own fears and longings, primordial urges and survival tactics. Through exploring the life journey of an animal, Morgan, lead us deep into an intimate history of humankind and the irreducible human sense that we must fight, fight to preserve. The idea of anthropomorphizing a female as a god strongly dictates the cruelty of mankind's obsessive prejudices by masking the entire process through the transferring shape, subsequently making the readers to understand how a human is often subjugated in terms of his sexual commitments and other ordeals during a childbirth. However, the author never lets the readers down just by showcasing how the females are treated in the patriarchal society. We find that the males are equally suffered in the place if they do not fill, fulfill the expectations, especially when there's a question of minting money. Both the genders are unanimously treated uninvitingly by the hierarchical groups in the village. To substantiate the above statement, we have an incident where the old woman had asked the regime officer to be careful while piercing Punachi's ear as a part of official proceeding. The resultant consequence is nothing but the ruthless humiliation. In addition to that, a strong threat to seize a goat uh, through a false claim if she tries to teach the regime officer on how to do things or how things are to be done. To which the old man replies later to his wife, uh, I quote and unquote him, Folks like us can survive only if we hold our tongue. Even if, we, if, even if they hit us on the back, we should only mumble to ourselves. We shouldn't even breathe if neighbors can hear us. We have survived all these years, yet you don't know how, how even this much. Gramsci, we find an optimal existence of Gramsci's hegemonial theory, shouldering the dialogue of the old man. 
Gramsci's most widely echoed concept is that of hegemony, that a cl social class achieves a predominant influence and power, but by succeeding in making its ideological views so pervasive, the subordinate class unwittingly accept and participate in their own oppression. Well, as we analyze the novel, and like Pumichi, we find the other female gods in the herd are subjected to follow the dictations of the master, never allowing themselves to comprehend the actuality, precisely reflecting the plight of the old couple and other villagers who had, who had ingrained the concept of hegemony unconsciously throughout their life. The old couple who managed to tend Pumichi right from the day of their birth stands as the obvious product prototype of being Godhards. Though they considered Punachi as their own daughter and found her brilliance through a smart observation, they never minded to demean the goat while forcing her to a sexual activity uh, just to suffice the, the heat uh, aroused uh, in Punachi. On the other hand, the readers are exposed to the love of Punachi named Poovan, the male goat who resides at the couple's daughter's place as the life of a male goat cannot possibly extend to a year or the butcher or offered as sacrifice to the god. He confesses that, uh, quote unquote, Bowen, I didn't think I would stay alive myself. The death can come to a bucket. Die for meat. We die for sacrifice. For which Punachi replies, I quote and unquote Punachi, do you think a female has it any better? It's better to die than to go through the ordeal of birthing and bringing up kids. As a reader, one should not overlook the process of castract, uh, castracting uh, bucks as they generally turn as as they generally turn nuisance to the herd. The hyperactive bug Kaduwain uh, by me is an example of this case where he was brutally castrated to silence his brimming sexual desires, ultimately sending a shiver of fear to the rest of the herd. The story adds to the point where the village stuck in famine and people are deprived, deprived even a single course of meal. The very sight of malnutrition Pumachi carrying kids in her stomach completely leaves the onlooker to extend his, his or her sympathies on her. The last look of the painted... The behind the so-called civilization. The story reveals an ideology analyzing the trauma in terms of both physical and mental state of the characters in the constructed world of Murugan with respect to their gender expectations as they were evidently etched into the minds of people to lead a structured life. The irony of one considering superior to the other touches the satiric tone of Murugan as everyone would be a prey you know, to the unfair social expectations. Bringing Back the views of the translator, uh, uh, Kalyana Raman. Punachi as a normal doe, start, starting her life as a foundling and going through the ordeal of being a miracle, she experiences both the promise and the structural violence embedded in the life of a woman. In Murugan's tale, she turns into a stone idol at the moment of her death, harking back to the uh, hoary tradition, folk Tamil culture, uh, culture of Tamil Nadu, whereby the memory of an innocent girl destroyed by the random and ever-present violence of the world is worshipped as deity, which as a reference in his, uh, in his previous book, One Part Woman, which is Madhuri Bhagan. Um, and this may well be the key of reading this novel as an adult literary text of our times. The novel brings out the feelings and experiences of animals, where the countless manifestations of their physicality attract and describe with, flair, with, with a flair tone. The world of Punachi would definitely be related to a tribulations of agonized existence of a woman, thus representing the unacknowledged cause of gender expectations and the narrow thought behind hierarchy fills the space of the novel Punachi or the story of the black goat while smartly relating the crucial trials of the people through the skin of the goat. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Kasuri. We'll take the QA session towards the end of the uh, presentations. Uh, I would like to call upon the yes. next presentation. Yes, sure. Yeah. Shruti S. Kakatil, research scholar, Sri Shankara University of Sanskrit, Calgary. She's uh, talking on the topic, investigating the female fitness narrative of individual empowerment. Now, okay. Okay, thank you, ma'am. I hope you all can hear me. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the complete title of my paper is um, Investigating the Female Fitness Narrative of Empowerment, Transforming Survivors into Iron Butterflies. Okay, so let's start. 
Fitness studies gained traction in the 1970s during the culmination of a physical culture based on the idea of muscular body possessed by a set of male Hollywood stars, including Edward Schwarzenegger and Sylvester Stallone, which eventually set up a fitness craze. Conceived amidst a masculine-centered culture, fitness perpetuated the dictum, beauty is health, thereby cementing the heterosexual male-defined beauty. However, very soon it was taken over by the female population, resulting in a proliferation of bodybuilders clearly set their rise on appending the popular view of fitness regimen as an all-male order of the machos. This global and exotic phenomenon soon witnessed waves of transformation wherein gender identities and body consciousness became a subject of debate. As Johansson states, nevertheless, women gradually entered into the subculture of bodybuilding, and in many ways, this was probably also the start signal of rapid transformation of the whole idea of physical culture and muscle building practices. Female fitness studies that falls under the purview of movement feminism, also called post-feminism, focuses on individual choices and attainment of the female self, which is often lost to a time schedule four times more than the time spent by the male population in household activities. This empowerment strategy, cobbled from the ideals of female bodybuilding, is one that lies closely in contact with Paolo Freire's definition of empowerment, as it can be seen as an iterative process by which individuals or groups who are without power create awareness of existing power dynamics, develop the skills and ability for regaining power, act on these skills to gain power without infringing on other individuals' rights, and facilitate and support the empowerment of others in their group or community. The further iteration that women's empowerment is a process that can be facilitated by physical activity or an outcome of physical activity participation, thereby viewing empowerment as a movement for upliftment that manifests in spaces of physical activity. As this paper particularly deals with victims of domestic abuse, fitness has proven to be a greenhouse for the downtrodden and the oppressed to build self-esteem and strengthen community. For most, it proves to be an experience of healing and wholeness, whereby they can spend time prioritizing themselves over others. To be empowered is to gain power at individual and social or community levels. In this context, a discussion of the current most popular level three female fitness trainer and activist, Jasmine M. Musa, becomes imperative. A survivor of domestic abuse, she has turned the whole narrative of female fitness training on its head, uttering a powerful cry for gender equality. Jasmine, the woman who refused to suffer in silence, is now a community influencer and one of the female voices who speaks truth to power. In a society where fitness is seen as a tool for furthering and molding feminization, making it fit the standards of patriarchy, wherein the attainment of a sculpted figure has taken over the female consciousness, a woman like Jasmine, defying the standards of feminine beauty, aims to question our notions of fitness as mere projections of male fantasy. Hence, this paper aspires to investigate the popular female fitness narrative of empowerment, which is overpowered by its serious inclination towards appropriate female fitness as one that emphasizes femininity. Female bodybuilding was heavily criticized as women building muscle were often seen as a threat against natural bodies and gender identities. Muscles were accepted as long as they were inscribed into a polarized understanding of gender. This rendering of success stories without prompt analysis has given rise to a culture surely driven by hegemonic masculinity, resulting in a genre of body makeovers that emphasizes a certain kind of boomy femininity, highly sensualized and eroticized, referring to bikini model body. On the other hand, women like Jasmine, set to break normative gender stereotypes, engage in exercises meant for heavy bodies, largely masculine, thereby ungendering fitness, as well as countering women's inferiority in the realm of physical culture. Empowerment, the multidimensional construct, has a large and varied lexicon, extending to various spheres of human activity, aimed to break the pernicious binds of power. Broadly speaking, empowerment refers to the process in which people and communities gain control over their lives. Within the context of movements of social justice, empowerment is the movement of an individual or community or population relegated to the margins of a disadvantaged social system. It's not a free ride to the center of power politics, but a battle that has to be fought for the sake of one's freedom and in the hope of a better future. Paolo Freire based his views on empowerment for the marginalized as a movement of love, resistance, and transformation through education. This Brazilian educator who experienced the impact of the Great Depression in Brazilian society and its debilitating effects on the country's oppressed took to developing an educational strategy for the poor and the disadvantaged. 
according to him critical consciousness and dialogue are the two prongs of empowerment critical consciousness or awareness resulting in reflection gives rise to action that makes transformation possible while dialogue is an encounter among men and women who name the world it must not be a situation where some name on behalf of others these approaches foster a certain participatory mechanism that develop a sense of responsibility to hold demagogues and their oppressive institutions accountable fitness plays a very important role in ensuring that women achieve increased self esteem bodily competence contributing to development of leadership skills and to adopt a positive outlook it helps them to undertake measures that results in a certain redistribution of power in arenas of activity thereby affecting the prescribed manifestations of power fitness empowerment envisages the idea that through increased strength and physical prowess women can tackle the status quo thereby correcting gender disparities self compassion is also achieved which particularly helps women with a history of domestic violence to promote their own choices over the prescribed consciousness of their oppressors jasmine and musa the so of gentle confident bell from the northern ultra cons- conservative bells of malappuram has given new hues to the female fitness narrative of bodybuilding especially on a national basis with a new wave of female bodybuilders taking over various social media platforms she has definitely raised the bar of female fitness especially since muscular women in india was a rarity and a highly unpopular among the male audience jasmine's journey from being a victim of domestic violence surviving two abusive marriages both ending in divorce pushed her into being a social pariah at an age as young as an undergraduate student a battered woman torn of self esteem pride and freedom it was through the intervention of fitness she could retain the status of an individual it is this reconstruction of self identity emotional and mental stability that is granted by workout routines which often takes the heat away from heightened vigilance and post traumatic stress disorder which is mainly seen in victims of domestic violence more than securing a sense of vigor and vitality it imparts a feeling of accomplishment over the completion of workout routines for jasmine her transformation is an expression that paves the way for liberation however it's tantamount for the oppressed that they first critically recognize the causes of oppression so that they can create a new situation which makes possible the pursuit of a fuller humanity physical activities as a humanizing experience makes critical evaluation of oneself possible by eluding social isolation the video which has been largely received has garnered an overwhelming response which was a full new experience for jasmine she remarks on the benefits of having permanently chosen a vocation and the rediscovery of herself as she says i have a job an identity and people who love and support me every day if i had waited for things to get fixed on their own i might not have been alive but my decision to live my life for myself changed everything taking part in the act of bodybuilding has granted her freedom freedom to choose and to love above all to love oneself her life that has been recapitulated through various social media platforms in the form of pictures and videos constitute frere's concept of the pedagogy of the oppressed since in the first the oppressed unveil the world of oppression and through the praxis commit themselves to its transformation for jasmine it was the transformation video that happened to be a life changing act or the praxis wherein after subjecting to a long and enduring ordeal of labor to bring this new individual to life no longer oppressor no longer oppressed but human in the process of achieving freedom according to the second stage in which the reality of oppression has already been transformed this pedagogy ceases to belong to the oppressed and becomes the pedagogy of all people in the process of permanent liberation of the prescribed empowerment strategy this video received by netizens with considerable amount of likes and shares has managed to obtain wide circulation impacting people's everyday lives forever changing traditions and practices challenging the surge of the ideals of patriarchal hegemony thereby adding to the rich narrative of empowerment practices thank you thank you ms shruti okay sure ma'am okay want to the next uh, people that is by bhagyalakshmi mohan uh, she is assistant professor of english hadidasan gun college for women puducherry she is talking on the paper titled violence sexuality and women reading the malayalam movies varathan and chola now over to you ms bhagyalakshmi a uh, very good afternoon to one and all and the title of my paper is violence sexuality and women reading the malayalam movies varathan and chola the pap- this paper attempts to uh, read the two malayalam movies uh, varathan and uh, Uh, the outsider and chola the shadow of water on the contention that kerala public sphere is an ideal realm of caste patriarchy 
and it tries to look at the portrayal of women in terms of sexuality and violence and tries to locate these movies as naturalizing the gender stereotypes even when these movies appear to be innovative both the movies were widely discussed and celebrated for its portrayal of nature realistic tendencies rejecting the notions of hegemonic masculinity which is associated with the construction of a hero in the malayalam movies etc varuthan or the outsider is a 2018 movie directed by amal nirat it deals with the story of priya and her outsider husband abin who come back and uh, who came back and settled at priya's family estate after abin loses his job in dubai the movie portrays the problems they have to face in kerala the life in kerala is shown as under the surveillance of a group of men starting from the taxi driver from the airport which is new for a person like abin who was born and brought up outside kerala abin is surprised to look at the photos of the male ancestors only males are there books gadgets and firearms in the house abin is shown as a passive male who is not at all a dominating figure and priya has equal visibility with him in the public sphere in the earlier part of the movie abin witnesses a couple being attacked by the locals his wife being abused the attempts of an honor killing etc and in the movie uh, priya is portrayed as a bold woman who is from a prominent christian family in southern kerala priya's authoritarian notions of her household are thus shown in the earlier part of the movie but later when she is molested by uh, josi and uh, his gang she blames abin for not protecting her as her father used to do and uh, abin is shown as crying out of helplessness which seems to be different when we look at the history of malayalam movies where the heroes are always portrayed as powerful the movie the seems to question the notions of male gaze voyeurism honor killing women abuse moral policing etc and suggests that uh, kerala public sphere is the ideal realm of caste is patriarchy but in order to question this uh, this uh, these all things movie does not break away from the patriarchal notions and interestingly creates an alternative patriarchy and the movie questions the male gaze by intentionally gazing on the body of the heroine clothed in western attire and if you look at the history of malayalam movies we can see that it has always given importance to patriarchal notions it is interesting to note the continu uh, continuity of these notions in the movie varuthan when it raises the questions against the societal notions by locating priya as a part of patriarchal institutions like marriage and family Here Priya is the tar- target of the males as she was once unattainable to them her visibility in the public sphere that to note as an asexualized woman irritates them and conveys uh, conveys her identity as an approachable woman another reason can be her marriage to an outsider who is considered as a passive male by them showing the traits of kapurushatva in nandi stamps but later when they even term him as a terrorist or mao maoist and accept his masculinity in the end we can see priya being tamed as a docile wife and the gender roles are clearly demarcated in the uh, movie in the end also when he locks his gate and puts the board trespassers are prosecuted we can see that priya is safe inside her home So the movie deals with the notions of inside outside dichotomy for women and stresses that home or inside is the ideal space for women chola or uh, the shadow of water which can be read as chora or blood as the posters of the movie suggest is a 2019 movie directed by sanal kumar shashidhar the movie starts with a grandmother's tale which stresses the importance of virginity and poses the question whom does the women belong to which is answered by uh, it was answered earlier by sage kanwa in shakundalam um, chola deals with the story of a village school girl who was taken to the city by her uh, teenage lover who was accompanied by his boss but the uh, girl is unable to leave him maybe because of the notion instilled by her grandmother or mother the movie seems to pose questions against the male gaze women abuse or girl child abuse rape etc but the movie seems to be taken uh, as a warning for the girls who goes outside the confines decided by the society for her here the name of the girl is janaki one of the names of sita and she is punished for crossing the borders of her home 
Her presence in the public space with her boyfriend makes the boss consider her as a person who has gone out uh, in search of sexual pleasure and he treats her in such a manner. In the end of the movie, the boy who once fantasies Janu as an object is able to tell her that nothing happened to her and he would marry her. He's crying out of helplessness by seeing the fate of Janu. He's able to kill the masculine boss too. But the movie rejects the chances of life of a fallen woman like Janu by using the grandmother's tale in the beginning and instructs the women to be inside the home. Also, Janu seems to be a girl living with her mother and the presence of a working class mother throughout the movie, through the words of Janu, tells us about the absence of a father figure in the family that might have led to all the problems as the movie seems to suggest. And Janu's low class and caste identity does not seem to allow her to choose a different op option and she has to be a victim. Also, the movie reminds us from the beginning that the public space does not belong to women and women should say, stay inside her home. It can be inferred from the scenes that show the public toilet in the tea shop, the mall, the beach, the city, the lodge, etc. This, when we look at these movies, both the movies are psychological thrillers and deals with the life of women. And in both, nature is a prominent character that supports the violence and this masculinity. Uh, the movies constantly remind us that women should be inside her home and she has access to uh, public sphere only upon certain conditions. Also, the movies seem to reject the notion of ideal women and the notions of chastity in the portrayal of the women characters here. Maybe because uh, the women do not come under the so-called Hindutva ideology. Uh, the movies also yeah. use the techniques of realism and seem to address certain issues by clinging to the conventional notions that favors the patriarchal ideology, which are a part of the Malayali modernity and the so-called Kerala identity. This the movies seem to advocate women to be subservient to patriarchal ideology by using the notions of violence and by sermonizing women to repress their sexuality. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Padmilishmi. We move on to the next paper. That is by Ms. Namita V.S., Research Scholar, Center for Search English, St. Joseph's College, Devagiri, Calicut. She's uh, her paper titled Transcending Gender Binaries, Cross-Dressing in Select Malayalam Movies. Now over to you, Ms. Namita. Good afternoon, ma'am. Am I audible? Yeah, you are. Please go ahead. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, actually, I'm press. I am trying to present my paper on screen. Okay. Just a minute. Can you see the screen? Uh, not yet. You're doing screen sharing, right? Yes, ma'am. Uh, it is not yet being visible. Is it visible now? Yeah, I think it's coming. Yeah, yes, it's. It is, yeah. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. My paper is titled Transcending Gender Binaries Cross Dressing in Select Malayalam Movies. So, uh, first of all, about cross dressing or transvestism or uh, wearing clothes typical of the opposite sex. Uh, it has been used for disguise, comfort, pleasure, and self-expression throughout the history of human society. It is actually the act of dressing up in the costume, which is generally attributed to the opposite sex. The word transvestite was coined in 1910 by the German sexologist Magnus Hirschfeld. In many cultures, it was done for religious reasons. Some did it for sexual gratification and many others as a result of their fetishistic behavior. 
Hans Bertens, in, uh, in his book, Literary Theory, The Basics, writes, quote unquote, cross-dressing is perfect for destabilizing generally accepted views of gender and sexuality. Clearly, the act of cross-dressing, that is, the appropriation of gender characteristics normally associated with the other sex, has significance beyond gender and is simultaneously a sexual act. But in popular culture, it has become a means to generate love for in the audience. An analysis of cross-dressing in films points out the fact that it is being used with many other intentions. So coming to cinema, we all know that cinema or film is a highly influential media and it is essentially hegemonic. So this paper is about the depiction of cross-dressing in the context of Malayala mainstream cinema since its beginning to the present. Films had always been stereotypical regarding the topics of sexuality and gender, which portrayed and at the same time made ideological impacts on the dominant images of masculinity, femininity, body and identity. Over the years, Malayalam film viewers have grown up watching crimes, including murders and rapes on screen. But our mainstream filmmakers have always shed away from films that speak about the lives and relationships of people belonging to alternative sexuality. Though the representation of transgenders is a recent phenomenon in Malayalam cinema, cross-dressings were a popular mode of entertainment. The cross-dresser or transvestite is perceived not as a serious identity or preference, but as a figure of ridicule. They are never presented in the way as they are. They are used for comic or erotic purposes or for the purpose of ridicule. The cross-dressing on screen emphasized on the social construction of gender and sexuality from the patriarchal point of view. So this paper is an attempt to prove that social conditioning has restricted gender roles even upon cross-dressing. It brings into light the roles of these cross-dressed human beings in films and also how the cross-dressing of men as women is different from that of women as men. It also analyzes how a cross-dresser is shown either as a figure of ridicule or as an erotic figure. The first movie is Ammiyana Satyam by, directed by Balajandra Menon, which came out in the year 1993. Uh, so in the movie, 15-year-old Parvati, uh, Annie, played by Annie, witnesses her family getting murdered by Jagannath Varma. She runs away from them to save her life. To prevent getting caught, she disguises herself as a boy named Thomas and starts living as a servant in a house of bachelors. As a boy, she is very hardworking. She does not try to please anyone. She does not get sexually attracted to anyone or even does not attempt flirting or attracting anyone. The boy character is portrayed as a very ideal, having all the good qualities and the like. She gains respect and recognition as a human being when she is not in her female identity. She engages in physical labor, which is often considered to be the prerogative of men. One of the bachelors, Omana Kutten, later discovers that Thomas is actually a girl. After hearing her story, Omana Kutten and his friends try to help her and everything ends well. Coming to the second movie, Daya, directed by Venu, which came out in the year 1998. So here Daya, the lady, uh, she masquerades as Samir and she undergoes difficult tests like an archery competition, a sword fighting duel, horse riding and a game of chess. She shows enormous courage and willpower. She administers justice, punishes all the evil doers, and establishes peace in the country. Finally, Daya, who is a maid, is elevated to the role of a minister who leads the country only when she appears before others as a man. A woman who does cross dressing is viewed as climbing up the social ladder in the gendered society. Coming to the next movie, Maya Mohini. Directed by Joe Thomas, which came out in 2012, Mohana Krishnan becomes Maya Mohini to know the secret of his father's death. Men get enamored by her beauty without knowing, knowing her true identity. Maya Mohini dances before Rajkumar Patela, makes him a puppet in her hands. Maya Mohini is portrayed as a very sensual person. Her dressing style itself is proof enough for that. She is very glamorous, capable of attracting men towards her. All the male characters in the movie gets interested in her and falls for her. Cross-dressing and acting glamorous here 
is a cover for secret inquiry into the cold hearted murder of Shankaran Poti, Mohan Krishnan's father. So Judith Butler has rightly argued that gender is socially constructed and it is performative. Gender roles are social expectations that define behaviors that are appropriate for men and women in a particular society. In these movies, men and women perform certain gender roles and at some other point of time, as the situation demands, perform yet another role. The masculine identities achieved by cross-dressing are rooted on their mastery of performance that range from physical to intellectual power. The prime task before a woman is to save her life and honor, while it is never a concern of the men. Maya Mohini lures the business magnate Patela using the charms of his feminine body. He is not becoming an object, but has control over the things. But women does not have agency and become mere objects of men's sexual pleasure. So I, I would like to conclude my paper from a quote uh, from Judith Butler from her book, Gender Trouble, Feminism and the Subversion of Identity. Quote, unquote, when the constructed status of gender is theorized as radically independent of sex, gender itself becomes a free floating artifice with the consequence that men and masculine might just as easily signify a female body as a male one and women and feminine a male body as easily as a female one. Thank you. Thank you, Namita. Now we'll have the last paper of this technical session that is by Dr. Renjini R, Assistant Professor of English, Government Arts College, Taikad, Trivandrum. And uh, her title of her paper is Rituals of Pollution and Analysis of Menstruation Taboos. Over to you, Renjini. Thank you, ma'am. Good afternoon, respected chair and participants. My paper is titled Rituals of Pollution and Analysis of Menstruation Tablets. This paper is inspired by my recent reading of, am I audible? Yes, yes. You am are. I audible, ma'am? Yeah, yes, yes. Yes, you are. Go ahead, please. Okay, I'll continue. Okay, ma'am. This paper is inspired by my recent reading of two Victorian novels, Wuthering Heights and Jane Eyre, Classic Tales of Love and Passion written in the same year, 1847, the two sisters, Emily Brondi and Charlotte Brondi. These two novels sparked debates on gender and sexuality, patriarchy, class divisions, and subjectivity. However, I was totally stunned by the utter silence in the novels on menstruation. The issue demanded more research on considering that they were written by women, enjoyed by women readers, and interpreted and critiqued from different theatrical perspectives and also adapted into cinema and television. I felt compelled to look into the novels of prominent Victorian women novelists such as Anne Bronte and George Eliot. I came to the realization that silence on menstruation in novels by major women writers of the period is symbolic of the Victorian attitude on women and female sexuality, which advocated separate spheres for men and women. The privilege of guarding the domestic sphere was entrusted on women while men were required to labor in a world deprived of morals. The theory of separate spheres had a deep impact in the Victorian discourses on education and medicine that even doctors reported that intense academic study for women would cause their ovaries to shrink. Later in the century, when Oxford and Cambridge opened their doors to women. Many families refused to let their clever daughters attend for fear that they would make themselves unmarriageable. The sexually prudent Victorian society with its prescriptive morality of meetings between young men and women monitored under the guard of a married woman did shower criticism on sexually ambitious heroines such as Jane Eyre and Vicky Sharp who desired to marry their employers. It is against this literary and historical background that this paper explores the silence on menstruation. This paper reads the silencing on menstruation Victorian fiction as a trophy of how patriarchal discourses have used the process of menstruation to socially define women and their standing within the social hierarchy. These cultural texts brand the female body as a site of procreation 
a metaphor for the material continuity of human race and also more importantly for the intangible proliferation of societal norms and values. This paper explores how an informed and insensitive approach to menstruation could make a positive impact on the lives of women. The paper explains how gendering of menstruation in women's experience as women's experience have led a normal biological process to be associated with cultural and religious taboos and social stigma. There are many taboos around menstruation, a normal physiological function unique to women around the world. The taboos range from Chopadi Pradha, a state of temporary seclusion for menstruating women, a ritual prevalent in many parts of Asia, including India and Nepal, to don't touch the pickle or it will rot. Women in rural India are denied even a patch of sunlight to dry the dirty rags they use for menstrual protection. It's disheartening to know that 11-year-old girl in Jiria Tamil Nadu died of snake bite, being forced to sleep in the menstrual shack outside. Menstruation. The monthly shedding of blood in non pregnant women, though it is surrounded by secrecy and myths in many societies. This is a normal physiological function for women between 10 to 55 years of age. It is a periodic process that reappears every 28 days. The experience of menstruation plays a large part in a woman's life. That her silence on this womanly experience by women in literature, cinema, or art is based on gender discrimination since menstruation has always been considered, I quote, a negative event which should be hidden and discussed. This is a quote from Susan Bailey. Taboos surrounding menstruation exclude women and girls from many aspects of social and cultural life. Historically, biological differences between men and women we used to justify the secondary status of women. In the 19th century, for example, women were excluded from education on the basis of the belief that intellectual stimulation would strain their delicate reproductive organs. There's a quote from Thomas M. Carey. Since menstruation is unique to women, it has become intrinsically bound up with the issue of gender inequality and has been used to exclude women from education and political life and to bar middle-class women from economic life. The, the topic of menstruation abounds with negative myths and stereotypes that ought to be removed so that women can be empowered through eliminating the unfair constraint associated with this aspect of the body. I conclude my paper. Thank you. Thank you, Rinjini. Thank I would you. like to congratulate all the presenters for uh, coming up with extremely refreshing ideas and enriching papers and also to stick on to the stipulated time limit of seven minutes. Uh, I shall make a, a quick recap of the papers presented and meanwhile I, I request all the par participants present here to post their queries or observations or even suggestions in your in the chat box because a session will become fruitful only if it is followed by meaningful interactions. So I shall make a very quick uh, recap uh, the first paper was by Ms. Kasturi, and uh, she talked about the paper focused on the gender confines structured in the rural uh, um, Tamil Nadu and the anthropomorphized door in the novel um, that uh, Punachi. And the feelings and emotions of animals is parallel to that of the humans um, in the novel. Now, the second paper was of Shruti S. Kakatil. Uh, she investigated the female fitness narrative of individual uh, towards individual empowerment, the important of, importance of physical fitness as a means of empowerment what her, was the crux of her paper. Then next one was uh, that of Bhagirishmi Mohan. She, she talked about the two Malayalam movies, Varathan and Chola, and interrogated the power relations and gender hierarchies explained in the two movies. The fourth one was that of Namita Vyas. She did an analysis of the cross-dressing, the select Malayalam movies. Uh, she talked at length on the uh, how the cross-dressing is different as far as male and female characters are concerned. And uh, she uh, concluded by saying that gender is um, conditioned and as well as, what, as, well as performative. 
the last one was that of Ranjini. She talked about the silences, or you can say aporias, about menstruation in Victorian discourses. She used uh, Foucault's theory and third wave feminism to reread the two classic Victorian novels. Now, the five papers are open for discussion. Excuse me, I have a question for Namida. This yeah. is changing. Um, uh, Namida, I think you talked about five films. Uh, Ammayana Satyam, uh, Daya, and uh, uh, Maya Mohini. Uh, 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 you didn't talk about some other films like Chandu Putta and I don't remember the name of this film. There was a film uh, in which um, Manoj K. Jain and Tilagan played the roles of Kijadas. Yes, ma'am. I think it was called Ardhanarishul, no, uh, something like that. Yes, ma'am. Uh, uh, you didn't talk about these films. Uh, so no, ma'am. Uh, uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, those, those films, they are actually transgenders. I was talking mm -hmm. about uh, cross-dressing, transvestism. So oh. uh, bo bo both are not, not the same. There is a difference yeah, okay. between transgenders and uh, cross dressing. Cross dressing okay. is actually uh, uh, the, the, there is a male and uh, he is dressed as a woman uh, inside the movie. Okay. Okay. Uh, but transgender is not that. Transgender is basically a man uh, who wants to be a uh, woman or a woman who wants to be a man who has attributes like, a, uh, like the opposite sex. Uh, did you talk about uh, Nyan Meirikuti and Chandukutta? No, ma'am. Uh, again, okay. Uh, so, yeah, uh, it's uh, maybe because uh, Meirikuti deals with a uh, transgender woman. Yes, ma'am. I was okay. actually uh, talking about, um, actually, in, in uh, the films which I selected, uh, towards the end of the film, uh, uh, actually, the man becomes the man itself. That is, uh, midway, uh, midway in the film, uh, for certain reasons, the man becomes a woman and later uh, he becomes a man itself. That is, he is dressed as a man itself. Uh, okay. For example, uh, if we take a film, uh, it will be more clearer. Uh, in the film Daya by Manju Arir. So actually, uh, Daya is a girl. So for certain purposes, she became a man. She cross-dressed as a man. And later on, she became uh, the girl they are itself. So thank you, Namida. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Okay. Any more questions from anyone? Um, Ms. Kasturi, um, you talked about that uh, you use the Gramsci's theory of hegemony uh, to write your paper. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, can you just explain um, a little bit on that? Yeah, sure. The concept of hegemony basically deals with the prejudiced notion of taking the social class, I mean, the upper, 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 upper classes, upper class people as superiors, and it is basically ingrained in the minds of uh, the other social classes. So I would like to point out the hegemony concept just because the uh, villagers, uh, were considered, I mean, they themselves considered as subjugated in front of the regime. And of course, if they try to overrule um, the, the, the path that is laid by the regime, of course, they would be punished. And as I had read of the, uh, read a few sentences um, from the novel, you might be clear of how the old man looks into the regime and how superior they act. Uh, like, uh, if you want me to go again, it says that even if they try to uh, hit on their backs, it on our backs, we are supposed to remain silent and the on, only thing that we can do is to mumble. Yeah. So here it shows not only that particular instance, we have many instances in the novel as such to uh, justify the part of hegemony where the concept of, uh, concept of being subjugated as deeply ingrained and nobody tries to question uh, uh, so the unfair rule of the regime that is happening in the village. And this setup is basically, uh, you know, from the earlier 20th century. 
and uh, we also find the, ru the rural setup is quite um, genuine in nature, where uh, it has no alienation uh, in their own concepts. Since we're, since we have more, um, media, I mean social media is here in in today's generation, the contemporary era, era as such, uh, we have many. Um, infiltrations in the thoughts, even in the rural area. But during the early 20th century, the early 20th century as such, when you look into the part, you find that the, the genuine uh, um, ideologies of people there, and that was particularly portrayed by Murugan in the novel Bunachi or the story of a black goat. And that was a part of uh, age really that I would like to talk with the entire paper uh, concentrated on the gender conflicts in uh, in particular and the age really was the uh, was a trial or the part a uh, part that actually uh, you know leads to justify that yeah yeah thank you thank you Mr. yeah thank you any more observations Uh, Gina Johnson, uh, shall, I yes, shall I Yes, ma'am. I don't think we have any more questions. Okay. Uh, thank you. Okay. So, thank uh, you, uh, Dr. Anchana and all other participants uh, for such an interesting and fruitful discussion. It was uh, truly insightful and relevant. Uh, Gina, I express my sincere gratitude to all the organizers for having invited me. And uh, last but not least, um, since I've been listening to so many uh, plenary sessions and uh, technical sessions in the last two days, I would like to add one thing. It was uh, really delightful to see student organizers who managed the session so well. A big hats off to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. I now invite Ms. Uh, Lakshmi Jay Mohan first year MA English Literature student of SD College Alapura for proposing the word of thanks. Over to you, Lakshmi. Good afternoon, everyone. It gives me immense pleasure to propose the word of thanks for the technical session 10 of the two-day international conference on gender studies post-1990 technological encounter jointly organized by the postgraduate department of English, Sanadana Dharma College Alapura and Beti Bajabo Abhiyan, Department of Student Development, Shivaji University, Kolhapur, Maharashtra. I would like to express a heartfelt gratitude to Dr. J. Anjana, Assistant Professor and Head of PG Department of English, NSS College, Pantalam, who chaired the session and with her presence made the session a pleasant one. A sincere gratitude to S. Ms. Ruti S. Kakatil, Ms. Bhagalakshmi Mohan, Ms. Namita V. S. and Dr. Ranjini R for their paper presentations on the key themes of this international conference, which were truly informative and gave deep in insight into the topic. I'm happy to express a heartfelt gratitude to Ms. Gina Johnson, second year MA English student, SD College session. Now, I would like to extend my sincere gratitude to all the teachers of the PG, PG Department of English, SD College, Alapura, the faculty and staff of Beti Bachao Abhiyan, Department of Student Development, Shivati University, for their valuable efforts and cooperation in the institution of this event. I must mention a deep sense of appreciation to all the student organizers for their effort in the smooth conduct of the event. Least, I thank all the participants who attended the session and contributed to its success. Once again, thank you all the presenters for this enlivening and knowledgeable session. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lakshmi. Uh, with that, thank you. Have thank you, ma'am, and the organizers. Thank you, Anjana, ma'am. Thank you, Anjana, ma'am. Thank you so much. Uh, with that, we have come to the end of the session. Thank you all uh, for being with us in this two day virtual international conference. We hope you really had an insight, working and a richly rewarding experience. Uh, please don't forget to join us in the valedictory session which will begin shortly in the same platform. The valedictory address will be given by Professor Jay Devika from Center for Development Studies, Trivandrum, Kerala. Once again, I thank you all for being part of such a lively intellectual experience. Thank you.